We'll give everyone one minute to take their places, but we will kick off in just a second. Great. Uh, well, why don't we get underway? Uh, it's um, a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the Fall 2022 Conference on Postal Regulation, which is devoted, of course, to the key topic before us as we prepare for next year's Extraordinary Congress, uh, that of opening the UPU to the wider postal sector. Um, we have a full day ahead of us. Uh, you're aware that our program is eight and a half hours, so we're going to have a, a healthy uh, opportunity to exchange views. And I'll talk a little bit more about the structure of the day in a few minutes. But I wanted first to invite uh, the Director General, uh, Mr. Masahiko Matoki, to uh, address us and provide his introductory remarks and thoughts on our uh, discussion and the work ahead of us leading up to that important event next year. Mr. Director General. Thank you very much, Stuart Sun. Good morning, everyone. So, the thing is delegates representing from the wider postal sectors. Dear colleagues, I'm very happy to see so many people gathering in the same room. So, I believe no more fears for the pandemic, I believe. So, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the UPU Conference on Postal Regulation. This has been a unique and active forum for UPU member countries to share and exchange their variable experiences and views on postal policy and regulation. In the second session of the conference during the Abidjan cycle, we will discuss the opening up of the UPU to wider postal sector players. As a sector-based UN special agency, the UPU is profoundly affected by the rapid and extensive transformation of the postal sector, mainly resulting from the rise of e-commerce and digitalization. More recently, designated postal operations have increased collaboration with wider postal sector players, such as customs authorities, service providers for e-commerce, fulfillment and security, and freight carriers and express carrier and logistic companies. These developments have not only resulted in the expansion and the increased complexity of postal service and supply chain, but also they have made clear the need to further develop and modernize postal policies and regulations. The Abidjan Congress recognized that increased access of wider postal sector players to UPU product services will help advance the mission of the union. Congress thus adopted resolution C11-2021 of further reform and opening of the union to wider postal sector players. The related CA task force has been working to prepare relevant proposals for further consideration by the Extraordinary Congress in 2023. CA Committee 2 has set up an expert team to contribute to the task force's work by conducting a technical review of UPU products and services that could potentially be opened up to wider postal sector players. So, this conference comes at an important juncture and the UPU's work on this topic. I invite 
top-level decision makers from governments, regulatory authorities, and designated operators, as well as wider postal sector players to actively participate in the discussion. I would like to sincerely thank the panelists for their participation in this conference today, and also our moderators, Mr. Samuel Dovi and Mr. Stuart Smith, co-chairs of the task force, and Ms. Naomi Hassan, and Dr. Rajib Ben Gopal, co-chairs of CA Committee 2, who will read today's fr uh, fruitful discussions. I would also like to recognize the co-chairs of the CA C2 expert team on the technical assessment of UP products and services. Mr. Peter Correll and Mr. Luis Gonzalez for their expertise and guidance in this difficult and technical work. With these remarks, I wish you an excellent conference. I will now hand the floor over to Mr. Zui and Mr. Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director General, for those words of welcome. And with that, we'll get started. Uh, as the Director General indicated, I have the honor uh, uh, to co-chair this with my co uh, friend and colleague from Algeria, Samir Zouawi, who is with us online from Al Algiers. Um, as I said, we have a long day today, and we've divided, as you see from the panel, our work into two segments. We're gonna talk first about how wider postal sector players can be better engaged in the decision-making process at the UPU, uh, how the institution can rethink its structure to allow that. And then we're, that's the panel that Samir and I will chair. And then we're gonna turn our attention to access to products and services, as the Director General indicated. And um, thankfully, Committee Two uh, has, uh, step forward to share the load with us, and uh, Raj and Nermeen will chair that session. Now this morning, um, we have, as you see, a Davos-style panel. And uh, we have four experts who represent the uh, various stakeholder groups in the UPU, and who are going to share their thoughts on this institutional question that is before us. Then we're going to open the floor for questions and answers, and for your input, um, your questions to the panelists and to us. Um, I see a, a large audience. I think uh, the IB has indicated to me that we are already over 100 people online. So we do have very good attendance today. And I did want to say one more thing about the style of the discussion today. A couple of you have remarked on my attire. I'm a little less formal than I usually am when I'm in the hall here. And we really view this as a conversation en famille. We're talking among ourselves about issues that are fundamental to the future of our union because we've talked about trends in the postal market that are occurring around us and we want to make sure that we are adapting ourselves in the best way to address them and to, uh, to deal with them. Um, so again, um, in a sense, um, if you're, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the, the term Chatham House Rules, uh, we're just brainstorming among ourselves. I, as the Director General said, we encourage everyone to speak up. We're not heads of delegation here. We're not necessarily speaking for our country or our company. We're just exchanging ideas and trying to uh, enrich the discussion and get it into a really detailed level. Because, um, and I will be frank, the key work is ahead of us. Uh, we are at the end of October 2022. Um, we will have the Congress next October, and I, I believe the dates that are proposed are October 2nd to 6th. And um, we have until S3, really, to work intensively to get those uh, proposals ready to be submitted to the Congress. So that's the agenda ahead of us uh, and my brief introductory remarks. And I'd now like to turn the floor over to my uh, dear colleague, Samir in Algiers, uh, trusting that technology will not fail us here. And he's going to set the scene a little bit for our first panel on institutional reform, 
before we uh, hand the floor over to our panelists and invite them to make their uh, introductory presentations. So, Samir. Thank you, Stuart, for giving me the floor. Um, uh, Good morning, delegates, Director General, distinguished participants. I would like to begin by thanking the Director General of the UPU for his support and his contribution to our work. By way of an introduction, I would like to state that one of the important principles that governed the work of the task force is the principle of inclusivity. That's very important for us. And the fact that we're having this discussion here today just bears witness to how important inclusivity is to all of us. We've tried to involve as many stakeholders as possible and as broad a swathe of our sector players as possible. I wish to thank everyone in advance for their contributions and for their comments. Let me just remind you of how we got here. A number of Congress resolutions were adopted in Abidjan. C11 and C12 are the ones that are of concern to us. And they instructed the UPU to put in place a group that would develop proposals aimed at further reform and opening of the union to wider postal sector players. This then was a task force that was required to examine proposals that would then be put to the 2023 Extraordinary Congress. The CA in accordance with that, set up a task force to deliver on this mandate, the mandate given to us by Congress. We put in place a task force and it is co-chaired by the United States of America and Algeria. This task force got down to work and in seeking to give effect to the mandate from the Congress, it decided that it would be appropriate to look at those resolutions and then convert them into specific deliverables. And then those deliverables were grouped into three work streams. Firstly, the institutional framework. Secondly, the second work stream, products and services. And thirdly, reform as a continuum. So that was the basis on which the work was done. And as my co-chair Stuart has said, we have always been focused in all of this work on these three areas. Institutional framework reform then is work, st work stream one, as you can see on the screen. We recognize the importance of the involvement of wider postal sector players in our activities, in the UPU's activities, including decision making. And that being so, the task force is required to make proposals on the appropriate future institutional framework for the Union in order to guarantee the future participation of these wider postal sector players. And there are a number of scenarios that might bring that about. Without further ado, I'll give the floor back to Stuart. You have the floor. Could the interpreters request that all those participating online mute themselves if they are not actually speaking? I just wanted to add one word to uh, one uh, uh, comment to that. And um, you will hear more details about this in the afternoon, but in our work in the task force, one of the important things we've done over the last few months is solicit input from all of you, from all of you stakeholders. And we've drawn some conclusions uh, from that work, and we will go, as I say, into more detail this afternoon. But before we turn the floor over to our panelists, I thought I should at least mention the broad direction in which the task force is proposing that the UPU go on institutional reform so that our panelists can comment and so that you can ask questions about it. And um, Samir has mentioned the resolutions that guide our work um, from Abidjan. Those were part of a consensus decision that we reached on this 
uh, opening issue to lay the base for our work in this Abidjan cycle. Another element of that consensus decision was some changes, uh, were some changes that we introduced to the consultative committee, which is the organization, the body that has existed since 2004, not to steal your thunder here, uh, Walter, um, to represent wider sector players. Now, that committee uh, has not been an unmitigated success, and I, Walter is going to talk to us a little bit about the reasons for that. So I think there is a general consensus that emerged from our survey that the status quo is not sufficient, that we need to look at further steps. But there was also a feeling that some of the more ambitious steps, uh, this is revealed from our survey, as those of you who attended our meeting or uh, I'm sure have read our report have seen, that some of the ambitious uh, proposals that we've um, examined, like a business council, were perhaps premature. So that is the recommendation that the task force will make uh, to the Council of Administration in the plenary tomorrow. Um, and I wanted to mention it, we'll give more details in the afternoon. But I did then want to introduce our panelists and uh, give the floor first. Um, well, first let me say that, as I said, they represent the four stakeholder groups in the UPU, wider sector players, operators, and the Postal Operations Council governments and regulators. But first we have our uh, esteemed colleague, Walter Trezek, who, chairs, who has chaired the consultative committee uh, through the Istanbul cycle and beyond. And so he's seen its work over the last four years and he's gonna talk about how that, how it uh, worked in that cycle, some of the ideas they had in the last cycle, what we did in Abidjan, and perhaps what more we can do. Um, now, you all know Walter well, so I don't really need to introduce him at length. In addition to chairing the committee, he's co-chair of e-commerce Europe. Um, and I'll leave it at that. I could say more, but I think uh, we want to hear from him. So, Walter, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stuart, uh, Director General, Deputy Director General, ladies and gentlemen, in the room, online, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Again, I would call that a milestone for the Consultative Committee. Thank you very much for giving the Consultative Committee uh, the floor. I would like, thank you, um, <clears throat> to my presentation. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, um, so uh, what happened um, in the last cycle? Um, when the cycle started, um, the consultative committee convened and um, actually uh, looked into the status of the consultative committee. Then the consultative committee was a consensus-based committee. Consensus-based in the sense that there was a clear representation from the POC, clear representation from the CA, the governments, the regulators, but also non-governmental organizations, multinational non-governmental organizations. Many of those organizations are still members. To give you an example, UniGlobal, for instance, yeah, the World Free Zone Organization, E-Commerce Europe, GS1, yeah, um, associations, organizations, worldwide organizations. Um, when we came together, we said, well, um, the whole setup of uh, the consultative committee is based on consensus. But um, it only gives the members the possibility um, to intervene and participate um, on, on a rather high level, not di direct participation. Um, and parallel to that, transformation, digitalization, the global postal environment for all stakeholders, all the opportunities and so on changed dramatically. The main purpose of the CC um, is to represent the interests and views of the wider sector players who are interested in supporting the UPU's mission and objectives. That's true for the last cycle and is, it is true uh, very much so um, for, for this cycle as well. 
However, the whole vehicle um, being consensus-based and only non-governmental associations um, as a member uh, was too little. Um, direct participation of the wider sector players, businesses, private in entities was not possible at all. And participation in standing groups uh, of high interest were restricted, or are restricted. Next slide, please. So opening up um, of the UPU to the wider sector players, um, drawing on the history, um, there was a clear step um, at Abidjan Congress where um, we made our homework in, in the consultative committee and found out that uh, the committee itself was not fully institutionalized. There was little recognition uh, of the potential contribution of a, a consultative committee uh, to contribute to the work of the uh, UPU bodies. And also very important, the financing mechanism was unsustainable. So the cost uh, of the consultative committee on a yearly basis was in about 200,000 Swiss francs. The membership fees were around 40,000. Well, that's not sustainable at all. So we were drawing from the resources, couldn't contribute enough, yeah? and um, uh, the added value uh, for our members, in particular those who didn't come from POC or CA, um, was not really there. So um, we worked quite hard and came, came forward with a transformation proposal. And that transformation proposal was finally introduced also in the consensus proposal for opening up. The consultative committee was a major part of that, um, and um, we were very happy to notice that the consultative committee was actually used for the purpose of inviting wider sector players to the UPU. So a clear value proposition for the CC members was to change, to invite the private sector um, non-governmental members, we called them non-state actors, um, to open uh, the membership for those actors. That was adopted. The interaction with uh, UPU bodies and input into the UPU's work, vice versa interaction um, of the consultative committee and the union bodies um, has been considered, but has not been adopted at full. Participation in the decision-making process still recognizing, of course, the intergovernmental structure of the union um, is highly important for those wider sector players. And um, that is still high on our agenda. Um, formalizing that kind of interaction um, of the CC with standing working groups and task forces um, should actually be further explored. But of course, the new members have to play a certain very active role there, proving their value to the UPU. That's absolutely clear. And uh, we tried to monitor that um, and implement that into our setup internally. Next slide, please. So how, how does the setup currently look like? Well, there is the consultative committee. It represents the interests of the wider sector and provides a framework for effective dialogue. Official promotion of the wider sector will be uh, reported through the consultative committee. The CA and POC via rapporteurs. Ah, so we have now an internal structure since, since two or three weeks. We have our rapporteurs, we have the thematic chapters, um, we have our internal working sphere, um, and I'm very glad that this is only possible because we had such an influx of new members to the consultative committee over the last three months, and you all feel that. Even the atmosphere in this house is changing a little bit. Yeah, not, not only because tonight we are also hosting a reception, but um, but uh, it is very important that these new members are here, and I welcome them, 
some of them are here in the room, others are online. So um, the plea here is that this internal structure now will start working. Next slide, please. So the consultative committee is still the only place to incorporate technologies, ideas, knowledge from wider se uh, sector players into the UPU's policies and regulations. So it's clearly streamlined. It is clearly a uh, facilitation um, of those, those uh, ideas. It should be the best place to access all postal players. Operators, ministries, regulators, in particular, when those new members have what we call the CC gold membership status, which allows them to have face-to-face -face meetings facilitated by the CC secretary. The CC facilitates access um, um, and helps um, those those new members to better understand what the products and services possibly already open to them are and a possible participation in development and re revision of certain specifications and regulations. It's knowledge sharing that should come from those wider sector players, most of them serving the sector anyway already, but now they have the possibility to share knowledge, to share expertise and bring it to the table where the future of the sector should be decided in the POC standing groups. Next slide, please. So when we talk about an enhanced consultative committee, so that, what could that be? Well, we have now a certain structure. There are certain members coming in. Obviously, they feel that there is a value proposition. Um, they are now getting engaged. They better understand how the UPU works. Yeah, they're channeled into the different work streams. They have their internal structure yeah, to participate and actually form what we call opinions um, of the certain chapters, complementing the structure of the POC and CA. When these opinions are developed based on documents coming from the standing groups, yeah, there is qualified input, which will be tabled to the standing groups yeah, to be recognized, hopefully, so that interaction can happen in a formalized way. I know that that interaction will only happen if that kind of opinion is of value to the standing groups. So I'm encouraging our members to provide that value, and I know that this value is available from our wider sector players. Only then, only then, the wider sector players and, and the consultative committee will be able to be incorporated in the future next steps, developments, revisions of standards and all the ongoing topics within the UPU. If you call that then decision-making transformation or qualified participation and knowledge sharing, yeah, for me, that's semantic. Membership transformation. Yes, I'm very happy to report that um, in up to the last day of September, we had 13 new members, wider sector players members, joining the consultative committee. And of today, I can report that we doubled our membership since the 1st of July. On the 1st of July, we had 15 members because we lost our dear members coming from the POC and CA. They now have observer status. And feel assured, um, the more wider sector players coming into the consultative committee, I will need the, the observers coming from the POC again because I need their expertise on how to handle possibly larger market-dominant organizations, which are already at the doorstep. So membership transformation um, is happening fast. So today we have doubled, we have more than 30 members, and there are more members in the pipeline. So another three applications are on the table of the DG as I speak. That's very good news. And we had a successful um, plea to new members supported by the DDG in Frankfurt during the post expo. That was very successful and thank you very much indeed Marianne for that.
So the internal org organization is now fit for purpose. Again, it was very good to have that exercise, to have rapporteurs taking responsibility to shape those work streams parallel to the POC and CA. None of those rapporteurs is a representative of a market dominant company. That's very important yeah, because they need to be neutral and they have to shape the opinion of the CC in a neutral way. The internal organization is now in force. We will have workspaces. We have the resources now um, also coming from the UPU, um, giving us the opportunity to start working on documents and position papers to qualify to be accepted by standing bodies, expert teams, task forces, and recognized as somebody who is giving value to the UPU. To give you a very clear statement, yeah, um, the UPU should actually see the wider sector players as contributing sectors. Yeah, so it's not the question what the wider sector players are asking from the UPU, no. It's actually the other way around. What are the wider sector players are bringing to the UPU? And there are very good examples already. There are top technology companies um, who are providing technology already to designated operators to overcome challenges in the fields of addressing, but most prominently currently in the fields of cross-border customs, cross-border VAT, cross-border input control system applications highly important, with full connectivity also to customs authorities. Interesting. Both, of course, in the non-designated area, but also in the fully designated area. They are here, and they are already placed their technologies into the hands of, of the PTC to be qualified, to be fully aligned to the UPU. So the UPU is playing already a gatekeeper role, yeah? actually looking into those technologies and qualifying them as compliant. And we will work on certification, we will work on auditing, yeah, so that these companies are fully transparent and, and in line with our regulations and controlled. This is a new membership class, by the way, in the future to come. Now, all about um, internal org organization. Next slide, please. These are our famous thematic chapters. Currently, we still have six. There's possibly a seventh coming because we recognized that academia is also interested in, in the UPU and would like to participate. So be prepared. Possibly uh, by S3, we will propose to the CA um, uh, another chapter for academia and knowledge sharing because we have applicants currently lining up um, they would like to participate and share their knowledge, but they also need to better understand the UPU. It's a give and take. So these are the thematic chapters. There you see how we are complementing it. Each is already uh, led by a chapter rapporteur. Um, they will start through a process of knowledge sharing and education so that they know how to behave, how to act, how to shape those opinions and then reach out to the standing groups for qualified input and interaction. This is very good news for me because I have to give something now um, to our members and keep them occupied over Christmas and New Year, to give them the feeling that they're actually active and working, because the next invoicing cycle starts in January. <laughs> uh, involvement is very important. Purpose and task uh, within the consultative committee is obviously a clear objective. Next slide, please. The reporting structure, um, therefore, is at the core of the whole uh, process in, in the consultative committee. And there we still have challenges. So there were um, certain proposals coming to Congress, which we took out again, and they were not incorporated into the consensus proposal, which would have changed that interaction in a more dynamic and more um, implemented um, interaction within the rules of, of, of the union. So what do I mean? 
Currently, it is uh, to the, at the sole discretion of the chair people of the standing groups and expert teams and task forces to allow access. The proposal um, on the table um, at la last Congress coming from the CC was we should take that around. It is general access and only in certain circumstances where there is clear cause to close certain, certain standing bodies, those bodies would, would close to wider sector players. Because there are certain trade secrets discussed, certain open data discussed, certain, certain um, terminal dues issues, what have you. Yeah? Um, we believe that our proposal is still valid. Yeah, and we will look into that, and that will be one of those elements of an enhanced consultative committee. But we understand, first, we need to qualify for that. Yeah? Broad access? No. I understand that. Qualified access and proving ourselves to actually bring value to the union, that's a different matter. Yeah? And it'll be up to us to, to prove that in a very short time span. We only have time just slightly beyond S3 for that. Next slide, please. There we are, thematic chapters. Here you see uh, the, the, the members who are now the rapporteurs. Um, I'm very pleased that, that that was possible. It was only possible because those, um, those members um, quickly joined um, after the CC o opened on the 1st of July. And uh, to give you a feeling, uh, we, we now are in, in the position still to welcome a new member each week. Yeah? This, is, this is very good news. It basically means that there is a clear value proposition on the, on, of, of the UPU. Most of those members are gold members. They're even prepared to pay 20,000 Swiss francs for that. And it's my job to educate them a little bit right now, but this will be institutionalized as well. We also have now um, a, a new vice chair. Yeah, um, he is present in, in the room, Santosh. I'm, I'm very happy because um, we also need a kind of safety net yeah, because previously that was only on my shoulders. And um, I tell you, my wife complained about that. I spent more time with the CC secretary than, than with my family <laughs> currently. But um, the success proves it today. Yeah, and I really enjoy that. So this is our structure. I'm very happy that this is in place. I'm very grateful um, to those companies who took that responsibility. They will have a lot to work um, leading up to Christmas and New Year. And um, it is my purpose then to match make those thematic chapters with the standing groups and working groups. Next slide, please. The structure, bronze, silver, and gold. Um, you see it tonight. Only gold members are allowed to pay for your drinks. Um, so um, there will be uh, three or uh, four new members currently um, hosting the event tonight. Um, and, uh, of course, they, they will use that also to represent themselves to you. Um, it gives us the opportunity to host CC events in, the, in this building. That's a right for gold members. Another right for gold members is matchmaking. Yeah, reaching out to uh, those governments and uh, designated operators they would like to talk to, and it is up to you to talk to them, of course, yeah, and, and also for you to choose in which format you would like to talk to them. And, of course, you can refuse that. No problem there at all. Next slide, please. And that brings me to the end uh, of the presentation. Um, you might have seen that we are quite active uh, in marketing the consultative committee on all that, those social media channels. And um, it's also um, quite interesting. Please, please watch us. There are new, quite exciting announcements coming soon about new members from all over the world and all continents. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Walter, for that very illuminating and uh, interesting presentation um, and quite detailed presentation. And I think um, appropriately detailed because as I said, 
What we are going to recommend to the plenary of the Council of Administration tomorrow is really focused on the consultative committee. So it's really important to understand how it has evolved over the years since it was created in 2004, what has happened since Abidjan, and as Walter said, it's been a great success in expanding its membership. That's an early success uh, coming from our decisions in Abidjan and a very encouraging sign for the future. But we want, as, as I said, we're looking at how we can further enhance it and ensure that that success is sustainable. But Walter has highlighted a number of issues that wider sector players would like to see as part of that enhancement. And obviously we have other stakeholders in the UPU will, who will have their own views about those requests and perhaps concerns, uh, perhaps not. I don't want to prejudge their presentations. Uh, but we have three additional panelists to comment on this, and I'd like to turn the floor over now to Samir, who will introduce our next speaker. Samir. Thank you, Stuart. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Can you hear me? Do you hear me, Stuart? Yes. Ah, okay, thank you. Donc, je remercie à mon tour. So, I too would like to thank the chair of the consultative committee. I think we heard an excellent presentation. And I now wish to welcome our second panelist, that is Mr. Jean-Paul Forceville, the chair of the UPU Postal Operations Council. And before he was chair of the POC, Mr. Forceville worked in many different positions within the UPU. He was the chair of the Post Europe Board, for instance. He is also very much involved in the work of La Poste, and I'm sure you all know him very well. I give him the floor. Thank you very much, Samir, says Mr. Forceville. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am really delighted to be addressing you here today. Just a few days ago, Siva was talking to me and uh, he said to me, you know, we would really like you to participate in the panel. The panel that is being organised on regulation. And I said to Siva, what do you expect me to say? And he said, well, I just expect you to be yourself. I said, are you absolutely sure about that? He said, yes. He said, are you absolutely 100% sure? He still said yes. So here I am. And I'm going to try to be myself. Now, I know that some of you attended the POC plenary last week. So you may have heard this before, and I apologize for that in advance, but I would just like to begin by making a few comments. I don't, I'm sorry, there is a speaker online who is not muted. Please mute yourself. Please mute yourself online. I was saying that I don't like the word or the words opening up because the opposite of opening up is closing down. And you have the impression, if you talk about opening up, that we were closed before we opened up. And I have never felt that the UPU was a body that had battened down the hatches that was closed down. We've always had observers participating in our work. And let's just think about this a little. The observers that we've always had have always been there to observe. Generally speaking, in the past, these observers didn't ask for the floor, didn't contribute to our debates, didn't make comments. At any rate, in this room, that was the case. But it may well have been the case that they gleaned some information in this room and with that information, they went to other bodies and then were armed with that information, so to speak. 
and it may be that they were then able to say that what was happening in this room wasn't what should have happened. I hope you get my point. At any rate, this was the kind of attitude in the past that uh, we saw, and this led to a certain level of frustration. I think that's something that we have to bear in mind, and we have to be honest about that. Sometimes people would say to us, uh, why don't you invite us to uh, attend or to participate in your working groups? And we would say, in response to that kind of question, because we want to be able to work among ourselves, sharing ideas openly and frankly, without ending up with a result that might be counterproductive for our work. I'm talking about the past here. All this is in the past tense, let me emphasize. But that was the past, and you can't forget the past when you're in an organization like UPU that's almost 150 years old, you've got a lot of past, whether you like it or not. We have a history, we have a culture that is transmitted from generation to generation. You can't close your eyes to that. And you can't compel an organization to change if it has not understood why it has to change. And people say, Look, we've been telling you for ages that we have to make progress, that you have to do this, that you have to do this, that or the other, whatever, you have to open up. Okay, okay, but why? Why are we where we are? Why have things not gone forward faster than some might have wanted? Well, people vote with their feet, to be quite honest. In other words, people hate to be told that they're going to be made happy despite what they want, that despite themselves, they're going to be given what's good for them, whether they recognize that it's good for them or not. You can't do that. People don't accept that. We're at a moment where we have to take people with us. We're on the brink of opening a new chapter in the history of UPU, but let's do that in a way that takes everyone with us and that crystallizes the goodwill that we all do fundamentally have for this organization. So let me now come to 2022. It seems to me that where we are now, and I'm now in the present tense, is going in the right direction and is going forward in an atmosphere where we respect one another and we listen to one another. And that's very important. Shiva, are you still happy? You're still happy with me being myself? You don't regret what you said? Okay. Well, in that case, I will now come to the POC. I believe, and I hope you won't hold this against me, I believe that the POC is a marvelous forum for dialogue, for exchanging views. In fact, if I hadn't believed that, I wouldn't have sought to be its chair. Why was the POC established in the first place? Again, we've heard a few slightly bizarre theories about that in the past, but let's, let's remember why it really was established. It was established because a number of operators in an evolving postal market in the 1960s, a market that was changing very rapidly at that time, a number of uh, postal operators in that environment said, we're going to create a technical body where we can share know-how and prepare for the postal sector of the future. That's what they said back in the 1960s. And they started with a fundamental assumption. Their assumption was that representativity within the POC would not be the same as within the CA. Because the POC and the way that uh, participants were represented there was supposed to be more technical. And therefore it was supposed to represent postal volumes rather than countries and perhaps their geographical or demographic situation. It was supposed to be based on technical postal considerations. 
That's the way that representation there was to be determined. So you ended up with some countries that appear to be overrepresented and indeed were overrepresented within the POC, but they by virtue of the very fact that they were represented there, were committing themselves to sharing their know-how, sharing their knowledge, sharing their expertise, their technical expertise, in order to take the whole organization forward. So time went on, things changed as the years went by, and we ended up with a situation where people started looking at the level of representativity on this council and feeling that some people were overrepresented, some were underrepresented. There was a lot of argument about the very legitimacy of the POC and about its future. There was a lot of talk about that at the last Congress. And what kind of answer did we come up with, an answer to all of these questions? Well, I think that the answer that we came up with indicated a deep commitment to the POC on the part of members. And that also, that deep commitment also means that there's a huge responsibility that's now borne by the POC. We are obliged to be relevant. We're obliged to continue to work as proactively, as intelligently as possible. This is implicit in the way that we now operate. We have enlarged our membership to 48, so we are more inclusive. We do better represent different regions of the world, and I'm delighted to see that. I think that the way that the POC is now operating with 48 members is indeed extremely gratifying and does represent progress. However, if in the future we are to continue to work in a way that is truly relevant to the evolving world in which we find ourselves. We need to establish a dialogue with the consultative committee that is both smooth and enriching for both parties. Now, since the election of the new CC, whenever it has met, the chair of the POC has attended, has made a statement, and has been there to answer questions. We have seen that the consultative committee is now structuring its work in a very interesting way. And I do thank you, Walter, for your presentation. I learned a lot from it, and I now clearly understand how you are organizing the work of the CC, and I think what you're doing is excellent. So we see the way that you're structured, the way that we are structured, and we now have to see how these two structures can truly dovetail, how they can speak to one another and work together for the good of this union. We have our way of working, you're going to have your way of working. I don't want to go into all the details of this, but we have to reach a common understanding on how we're going to work. You talked about your work areas, your six chapters. We have to consider how we can take them in, into account in our work and our discussions in the most productive possible way. You talked then about these uh, six areas, which might become seven. And it seems to me that uh, economic thinking is important. And thinking about the economics of what we do is important. And this is in line with what the DG and the DGG have said, where they talk about transforming the IB to make it a kind of think tank. And I think that anything that can feed into that is very welcome. For too long, Walter, we have found ourselves frequently in different bodies involved in a rather sterile academic discussion when we talk about the postal economy. And I think that the postal economy is something that uh, has to be more realistic and more realistically embedded in the work of what we do. So you talked about your six chapters and you said there might even be seven. I think there might even be eight. At the Innovation Forum, for instance, we had a lot of talk about startups that relate one way or another to our sector. 
And all of these uh, startups are really making us think, are pushing us forward. And I think we have to find some way, at least from time to time, of allowing those voices to be heard here so that we can really understand what they're doing. And they should continue to shake us up and shake us out of our comfort zone. That's something we want. So I leave it up to you to think of how we might actually achieve that. And let's bear in mind something else as well. We want dialogue with newcomers. We are very eager to hear what they have to say. And we very much hope that they won't be disappointed in us and in, and in what we do. They must not be disappointed. We must have a genuine dialogue that both parties can feel is worthwhile. I, I think you know what I'm getting at there. I'll just leave it at that. Now, one other comment on the issue of comparisons. We're thinking about the task force and its work, and we know that the task force took an overview of what we do here within the UPU and thought about how we might do things better and compared to what we do with other international organisations. I think that was quite a legitimate exercise and indeed a useful exercise, even if only to reassure ourselves that we're doing pretty well, that we are pretty relevant. So, OK, so we did that. We did that exercise of comparison with others. I think you have to recognise that there is something very specific to the UPU, and that is the universal service obligation. Universal service is a key part of the life of UPU, the history of UPU. It's something that's really pivotal for us, and it has a clear impact on the profits of designated operators. I remember in this very room, we had a meeting where we had representatives of different international organizations present a while ago. There was somebody here from ITU, I think from WIPO and a number of others. And I remember talking to them about what they did. And I said to them, look, in your work, universal service or something like that, does that come up? Does that have any kind of impact? And people's eyes opened very wide because for most of them, it was just not something that they thought about at all. They didn't have to deal with anything like universal service. It wasn't part of their remit. Now here, we have to have a global interconnected network that allows us to provide universal service. This involves linking operators from all countries of the world. And in many of these countries, there really is not a very big market. And that's why you have to have an operator in each and every country, guaranteeing that every man and woman on this planet has the right and the ability to receive letters and parcels. Now, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but uh, I would just like to bring my comments to a conclusion by flagging a few other points. I'm going to carry on being myself for as long as I can here. I see Sifas going, oh dear, dear, what might happen now? But I think that today we're at a point where we're looking forward to the 2023 Extraordinary Congress. Where we stand, that's on the horizon. And we're terrified of getting there with nothing. We have to have something. We have to have something. What are we going to say to 192 countries next year. What are we going to say if we haven't done anything about opening up? We have to do something. Now, I think we have to think realistically about this Congress. What really is the point of this Congress? Now, I believe that it was actually France when we were preparing for Abidjan that suggested that we have an extraordinary Congress, so I realised that there must be a point. But what was the point? Well, the fact is that we looked at where we were in the run-up to Abidjan and we said, look, we're not going to manage to take all the decisions we have to take in Abidjan. 
not all issues are right are right for decision at this time. We've had all the problems of COVID. We've had all kinds of things that have held us up uh, in our progress. We're not going to be where we want to be by Abhijat. We all said that. However, we also felt, but look, we can't wait another four or five years before we decide on things. So we're not ready to decide everything in Abidjan, but on the other hand, these decisions cannot be put off for four or five years. So let's keep up the pressure, keep up the progress. That's why we need an extraordinary Congress. And actually, I think we were right in that. And I think the proof that we were right can be seen just by looking around this room here. The fact we're here today shows that we're moving in the right direction and at the right speed. So, specifically, what are we going to have to decide next October at the Extraordinary Congress? There's certainly a lot of room for talking. But what I would say clearly is that we don't just want to take decisions for the sake of it. We have to decide on what we really want to decide and then go ahead and decide it. Thank you. <clears throat> Merci, merci infiniment, uh, Jean-Paul. Thank you, thank you, Jean-Paul. I would like to confirm to Siva, yes, indeed, Jean-Paul was true to himself. So thank you, Siva, for giving him the right to do that. The opening up of the UPU to the wider postal sector players is not something that runs counter to the interests of DOs. We all agree that we are seeking common objectives here. We want to have an interconnected, interoperable network involving everyone, and that has to be a global network. So thank you, Jean-Paul, for being so open and frank and for speaking so clearly and so eloquently. I'll now give the floor back to my co-chair, Stuart. Stuart, you have the floor. Thank you, Samir, and I'll join you in, in thanking uh, Jean-Paul for being true to himself and providing some provocative and interesting thoughts, I think some interesting reflections on how the POC was created in the 1960s, recognizing a changed market and the fact that we needed a technical body where uh, operators could exchange views. Um, as he suggested, I think, at, at one point in his remarks, we're at a similar point today where we have the market evolving again with a lot of things happening outside the UPU. And so figuring out that relationship between the consultative committee and the POC and other UPU bodies in particular is really why we're here. Um, I also appreciate his reminding us that in a sense he is the father of the Extraordinary Congress since uh, France had the idea that this was necessary. And I'd only remark that in that, in making that comment, he is previewing the third work stream, which we're not really talking about today, but the fact that reform is a continuum. And uh, we're looking today at institutional changes, access to products and services. Uh, as he said, we recognized we couldn't do everything in Abidjan. Uh, we recognize we won't be able to do everything in um, wherever we're going to be, and uh, we'll make that decision tomorrow. Um, but we will hopefully set ourselves up through our discussions here on these two topics to consider further changes down the road uh, uh, at future Congresses as well. Um, so th thank you, Jean-Paul. That's a very helpful uh, uh, perspective of the operator and of the Postal Operations Council. But we, of course, have two other stakeholder groups in the union. And I wanted to turn first to um, uh, the representative from Uruguay who's going to join us, hopefully online, uh, Mr. Guzman Acosta Ilara, who is director, and a pardon for my Spanish here because I, I, I may have difficulty, Nacional de Telecomunicaciones y Service uh, de Comunicación Audiovisual. And he represents the, um, the um, ministry that oversees postal issues uh, in Uruguay. And we would welcome your comments, sir, from your perspective. Good morning, everybody. And I'd like to welcome everybody uh, present today. Um, this organization with such a long history 
though it is without a doubt uh, that we'll be taking important decisions. As an organization, the UPU is legendary and it has to adapt. And in doing that, you have to take decisions together, which reflect the technological changes we're seeing. The role of the wider postal sector is important for designated operators. Um, it's important that uh, players from the wider sector and DOs can operate, uh, can operate together. We are in favour of opening up. Denying the opportunities which come from opening up is tantamount to rejecting the reality of the situation. The organisation cannot stand by and be on the sidelines as technological change takes place. We need to move with the times. We're in a world where the public sector faces many challenges. We have an obligation to provide universal service. Today, postal services are interconnected and the role of technology is growing ever more important. Infrastructure and a communication network are dealing with ever greater volumes and are moving into different areas uh, of logistics, for example, and we're seeing the active involvement of the private sector. Uh, and that can benefit more effective services. So, as I say, we don't want to stand on the sidelines while these trends uh, continue to develop. Uruguay, through its policies, is promoting growth and development in the postal sector. The designated state operator competes with other postal services, including private ones, national and international ones. We establish the framework for competition and through that we seek to maintain specified quality levels encompassing quality and accessibility of postal services. The DO in Uruguay has existed since 1915. It's a very long-standing organization and it participates actively in ensuring universal service. It covers 41% of the market and 13% is in the area of parcel post. But it's important to recognize the rest of the market as well. So it's important for this organization to open up. We believe that that can be of wider benefit. So we're seeing the active participation of the Uruguay Post with its uh, long-standing uh, history, uh, with its uh, uh, built-up networks, uh, ensuring um, access and universality. But there's also the issue of legislation which allows for the interoperability of the networks. These experiences are essential, of course. And we believe that um, through these processes we can create value, we can create wealth if we look beyond our organisations to wider participation. And governments have a key role in that process. They have in their hands the regulation of the entire postal sector. We must understand the impact um, that opening up will have. Uh, we cannot underestimate its significance for 
designated operators and for the provision of the, uh, their services. There are really two worlds, uh, one market which is highly profitable and the other not. Um, but those two come together when it comes to delivering services to customers. People need, people want an efficient service, a swift service with the guarantees um, that we talk about in this organization, uh, respecting the basic principles of good service and uh, universality. These are guarantees to society as a whole. The current market is undergoing profound change, which are linked directly to uh, the changes that we're seeing in technology. Startups are involved um, in this fast pace of change that we're seeing. Um, we need to harness that. We cannot fail to participate in these changes, fail to benefit from these changes. And that's why what we're talking about is so important. Our um, history of 150 years at the UPU is a huge resource, something that can contribute to add, uh, creating much greater value in this time of uh, change to the benefit of all. So I think that we can continue to talk, but it's more important that we move to act, uh, that we take the decisions uh, that are on the table and that we work together, governments and organizations to understand what is possible. I think we need to move from the moment of uh, discussion, as important as they are in, uh, in our meetings, to the moment of decision making, decisions that will enable us to face up to these new challenges uh, based on the principles of plurality and freedom. And with that, we can add a huge amount of value. We can enrich our knowledge, our services, and we can really harness the, the changes that are underway while still providing the guarantees that we have done for so long. I think we're looking at a win-win uh, situation and that uh, this process of opening up will be of benefit uh, to the organization as a whole. Organizations cannot stand still um, they have to keep on developing, moving forward, and I think that with this process we can move forward to a bright future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guzman, for those thoughtful <coughs> comments uh, from the government perspective. Uh, it's very helpful. And as we'll, as we'll hear in the afternoon, I think your comments about the importance of action, uh, the need not, the fact that we cannot simply remain where we are, that reflects where many governments uh, throughout the world are. And we'll share us results of the survey in more detail when we reconvene this afternoon. I'd also like to thank you for your comments about interoperability of networks. Um, that anticipates, I think, the discussion we'll have later this morning about products and services and um, reflects something that I think uh, many task force members have been reflecting on, the fact that changes are occurring at a national level in many countries. And um, the, our, work on, our work on products and services is intended not to steal the thunder of my C2 colleagues, is intend to, intended to explore how that can happen um, on a UPU level as well. Well, I'd like to turn uh, now to our fourth uh, distinguished panelist, uh, Zaidi Abdul Karim, who is with us from Malaysia and who is the head of Postal Courier and E-Commerce Services Division 
at the Mal Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission. And he will share with us the perspective of a regulator looking at this important issue we're addressing. So, Zaidi, I, as you wish. Yeah. Good morning. I don't have uh, many slides. <laughs> I don't have even one slide. <laughs> I thought it's a Davos style <laughs> because uh, IB said this is a Davos style, but I think this is okay. I think we are ready for the uh, startup style, <laughs> a bit more relaxed. And uh, I'm very glad the uh, conversation that we already have this morning uh, from a chair of a consultative committee. I think we can see the the, what we call it, the, um, the prosperity that the UPU can bring to the wider postal stakeholder. I think that is certain. The only thing is the pace that we can do. I think the wider stakeholders, when we, I talk in Malaysia, they're also thinking how they can be part of the United Nations to, be, to contribute to the Sustainable Development Goal, for example. When we talk about, for instance, uh, the uh, climate change or climate action, we cannot talk only about last mile delivery of the post. Because the post of the last mile is just only a portion of the big last mile in our country nowadays. And when we talk about dominance like our, our chair of the CC states, then we have to ask ourselves, in our domestic market, who is the dominant player nowadays? Is it the post or is it the private sector? I think the, the reality now has changed a lot. And we have to be truth to the reality that how can we address the, the, the reality on the ground in terms of our policy, in terms of partnership, in terms of regulation, in terms of policy. I think UPU can play an active role, and, and we are very glad and happy to see that UPU play a leadership role in this one, because we are now in a chicken and egg situation, whereby many member states are looking at UPU, how can we deal with this thing? And UPU also start to think, how member states are dealing with the wider stakeholders? I think many member countries are definitely looking at how UPU is going to deal with the wider stakeholders. And I'm also agree with um, our chair of POC that this is not, we are not talking about opening up or closing up. We have already been opening up for many, many years. We are now talking about the value of partnership, the equal partnership that we are talking about. See, the problem with us is sometimes we think that we bring value to the stakeholder, but I think the matter of fact is stakeholder has a huge value that can bring to the postal wider to the postal stakeholder. I think that is something that mindset that we need to shift, and perhaps we can also relook at our mission statement in in our constitution that we should really give a lot of value in terms of partnership in our mission statement rather than we put on the, on the bottom that is the things the dna of the future of upu that you become the platform for multi-stakeholders notwithstanding that we understand the, the the importance of universal service of course, we need to be cautious about this. We do step by step. We have a lot of committee. We have a lot of discussions. But we need to have a clear vision that UPU should be the center gravity for the wider poster stakeholder. I think that is something, a vision, that we need to really look at the UPU Congress in, in UAE, correct? UAE, is it? Yes. Looking at Malaysia, I think perhaps I would share a bit how our experience in dealing with wider stakeholders. We are not a perfect uh, model, of course, but perhaps we can share with you that in the last 30 years, we have been struggling as well how to deal with a wider stakeholders. I think we know 30 years ago, the post start to separate between the government and the operators. I think many discussion about how to separate that one. I think we have passed the stage of separations. And then we have the law, how to deal with the USO, 
with private, uh, with the uh, corporations to deal with the USO because USO is a public service is 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 run by the private operator. I think we many countries now are still struggling how to deal with that one, especially now when you, our mail volume is declining. I think mean, government is also look thinking how are we going to deal with the USO, and I don't think. We have a good solution at the moment, and we are not really addressing the, 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 the real problem of the USO in light of declining mail volume. I think this is a real problem for many member states. For Malaysia, every decade, I can give a summary that every decade, 10 years, we, dis, we, we have some transformation. I think when we separated the post and the government, in terms of USO delivery. And then we form a regulator 10 years after that from the government to uh, independent regulators. And from that time, we already started to have like the post plus, meaning there are private operators, the couriers operators, we start to bring them a bit, but they are not really part of our policy making. They are in our radar, but they are not really the one who we should say we regulate a lot. USO still the biggest component. But the last 10 years in 2012, we changed the law and we have the mandates that we know that things change and we need to have a vision for the next 10, 20 years. And we have incorporated a law that we redefine the meaning of post to include wider stakeholders, especially on the delivery parts. So they are all now <laughs> become part of our radar. And of course, for regulator to regulate post USO and a wider stakeholder is going to be more challenging. So we need more innovation. I think we have a session on postal regulation innovations, <laughs> how to regulate a wider stakeholders. We cannot regulate wider stakeholders like we regulate USO. Definitely we can't do that. We need to find ways how to do it. We need a more consensus. We have a lab. We have a common objective in terms of development. So we have a principle of regulate for growth. So we cannot regulate just for the sake of we have USO. We need to regulate for the prosperity of the country. We need to regulate for the citizens. And citizens now, they are not really saying, I need a postal service because they have multiple service operator. We look during the COVID, if you don't have multi-stakeholders delivery operators, the post alone won't be able to deliver the things during the COVID times. They won't. So, I think the reality is there is already coexistence of multi-stakeholders in the marketplace. So we become the regulator of mail and the regulator of parcel, not only the parcel post, but also for the parcel courier. I think that is something that we are working on. It's a work in progress. It's a very challenging, um, but I think it's uh, perhaps for us, that is the right direction moving forward we see the market is moving toward that directions the gravity now we all know the center gravity is no longer in letter service is all in a small packet is all in the parcel service so we need to shift our gravity a bit toward a parcel and then this requires some adjustment i again my my final notes uh, mr moderator i think upu is ready for the next Congress to shift the center of gravity from a pure post to the post plus. I think, I think that is my final conclusion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abdul Karim, for those thoughtful comments from the regulatory perspective, reminding us that each, each of our countries has a different regulatory regime and we're all grappling with, with how to address the changes in the market. And of course, as we look at opening, uh, we need to consider what, if any, 
uh, impacts there would be on that front. I'm sure wider sector stakeholders will have a word to say about that too and, and what they think the consideration should be. So, um, friends, we've, we've heard from our four uh, distinguished panelists here. Uh, we now have a little less time than we anticipated for questions and answers, but it's really uh, an opportunity to turn to all of you to ask questions of the panelists, to seek to explore some of the issues that they have identified. Um, and again, I would stress that what we're doing this morning is a warm up for what will be a much more open, uh, hopefully, discussion this afternoon where we will all exchange uh, views, uh, frankly, uh, respectfully, of course, um, but to get the widest possible input and to really have a detailed discussion about um, what institutional changes might be appropriate for the UPU going forward. As I've said, the Based on the survey we did, uh, with all of your input, the uh, task force has come up with certain recommendations. Uh, you've heard some comments from the panelists, I think, that relate to those recommendations, but now now's your chance to follow up on that. Um, and so I'd open the floor. Is anyone willing to uh, ask the first question? And uh, we no longer have placards. Uh, I would ask you to identify yourself, but again, you aren't, uh, we're not holding to you, you to whatever you say. It's not a national position. We're in an exploratory phase here. We're having discussion, uh, hopefully, that is open to explore the issues our speakers have identified. Please, yes. And if you could identify yourself in. Thank you very much. My name is Cornelia Berger. I'm a head of department in UniGlobal Union for Post and Logistics. Uh, we represent uh, postal and logistics trade unions all around the globe. And uh, we are a member of the CC. Uh, we are a already long-term member of the CC. And of course, we fully support the opening up of the, of the um, UPU to the wider postal sector. Um, but of course, because of the nature of our organization, uh, we just want to keep in mind that this opening up should be done in a very careful way and not only based on money, but also, and I think that's the spirit of the UPU and also always the spirit of the consultative committee to give room and the opportunity um, to NGOs and uh, to postal player sectors which are not um, in a business environment, but uh, representing all kinds of, uh, of parts of the population and parts of the citizens and parts of the postal workers, uh, giving everybody the opportunity to be involved. And I know we had some discussions, just I wanted to raise that here, that we are not, we are very much in a discussion always focusing on, uh, on uh, the wider postal sector in terms of competitors but also we should uh, seek out and get involved more NGOs and more um, uh, organizations which are not profit oriented uh, to ensure that the CC keeps the spirit of including everybody. I just wanted to raise that, but uh, um, also to bring that point into the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very important point. I don't know if any are of our panelists, perhaps Walter wants to comment on that, but the reforms that were adopted um, in uh, Abidjan uh, enabled individual companies to join, but it's important that associations, NGOs retain the right and ability to be represented in the uh, CC. Uh, Walter. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, UniGlobal, to be also rapporteur for one of the chapters. This is very important. Thank you for that. Um, but I, will, uh, I want to build on to your comment, Cornelia, because um, this is an extremely important point. And I also would like to take this opportunity to clarify for those who are shocked by these high numbers when it comes to, to membership fees. Yeah, this touches upon certain uh, non-for-profit organizations who cannot afford 10, 15, 20, or even 3,500 Swiss francs. Yeah. There is a clear provision, and I'm looking now at, at the chair of the CA. There's a clear provision 
um, that allows for those organizations to qualify um, entry into the CC with the same rights of any kind of non um, um, governmental organization and plea for a reduction of membership fees. Yeah? So the door is not closed at all. It's actually wide open. It, it has not been communicated enough. Yeah? And we have two or three issues already where we're looking in, into those applicants. So they are, they are more than welcome and we shouldn't forget, and I emphasized that I guess during the POC at one point, the postal service is a people's business. And when we uh, go through digitalization, we have to be extremely careful not to lose the people at the ground because they are responsible at the end for a high quality of service for those customers who are paying our fees. That's very important. Thank you. Sorry. No, thank you. Those are key points to remember the backbone of our, our institutions. I think John Paul has a comment too. Oui, j'ajoute quelques mots. Yes, thank you. I'd just like to add a few comments. Let's not forget, as uh, postal operators, that we are employers. We employ an awful lot of people. And that means that it's our responsibility to think about the future, not just for our companies, but also for our employees, the people whose wages we pay, after all. And it was perhaps a little surprising to hear earlier that in uh, France Post, we've lost two thirds of our volume. And clearly that has a knock on effect on employment. I don't want to go on about this too much, but I am aware of the issue. And I do think we have to bear in mind our corporate social responsibility as employers alongside everything else. Maybe another point. In this cycle, more than in the past, we in the POC are trying to listen to our customers, listen to what the customers want. And within the consultative committee also, we now have partners, we're listening to them and so on. But, and this is not an easy question to answer, how are we going to attract people who represent the voices of our customers, our customers. And I'm not thinking now exactly about our clients. I'm thinking about people who pay us. Because often we end up really serving the customers of our customers, so to speak. Uh, Comment as well. I believe uh, the President and uh, notre conseil voudrait prendre la parole. So I think our chair would like to take the floor, so we'll recognize him. And then I think we have China online. And then further speakers. Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm really speaking as a representative of a designated operator um, from the Côte d'Ivoire. I've listened closely to the excellent contributions we've heard. And I'm more than reassured, I have to say. I noted that um, we have to recognise the situation on the ground um, in our documents. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is changing the mindset, recognising the paradigm shift. It's, um, it's something that we have no choice about, even if sometimes uh, we are attached um, to the way we've done things. And thirdly, the importance of understanding that this is um, an opportunity for adding value on both sides. Um, we understand that the wider postal sector um, is an opportunity for the UPU and the UPU rep represents an opportunity for the wider postal sector. So I, I believe that if we are going to uh, tap these synergies, we need to move on to a next stage of open innovation because the world has changed. 
and we have to live with disruption. We are, are working with our experts. We're um, working with the great advantages we have, but we're not really open to the wider ecosystem, um, including startups, universities, research centers. And that's where the extra value can be created. We need to obviously formulate recommendations to our meetings. But before we next meet in this room, researchers, startups, innovative enterprises will have found two or three uh, new areas of work, the two or three new innovations, as the chair of the POC has said. It's always been the case that the UPU has been open. So, as he also said, perhaps opening up isn't the ideal term because we've always had this principle, but we have it as a principle and it's on the front of all of our documents. So we have to stick with it. But with my, or rather in my humble opinion, looking from the perspective of Africa and Cote d'Ivoire, Sometimes even operators um, who work with the UPU are also part of other private consortiums and we can lose our business um, to them in the name of progress and recognizing the reality um, in the changing markets. So we need to recognize that threat. We also need to recognize that we're being told to proceed with caution because uh, things are changing. We don't want to be too hasty. But we need to recognize um, where, our, where our interests lie. I think we all agree with opening up. Uh, we all agree it's important. But I also think um, that we should make sure that we forge a consensus as we head forward. Um, maybe we should focus on interoperability of postal operators and the wider postal world so that there is this kind of unanimous agreement uh, of our mutual needs. So I think these are such important subjects. I don't think that we can um, close this debate at any given point point. It needs to be ongoing, otherwise we'll just uh, go back to our old ways of doing things. I started putting the postal sector in 2011 and um, I, people were already talking about opening up, uh, recognizing the need for cooperation in the area of technological development. We're still talking about the same things today. So maybe our friend from Malaysia was right. We need to change our mindset. We need to recognize that we're living with a different paradigm. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank you, Isaac, for those reflections. And uh, I think you've highlighted the challenges of the changing environment around us, the speed at which it's changing, and uh, how we can respond to that, how changes are happening on a national level um, with the interoperability um, that I, I think our colleagues from Malaysia and Uruguay have mentioned. And I remember what you said the other day uh, as well about uh, not confusing vitesse and precipitation. Uh, speed is appropriate uh, and doesn't necessarily mean we're being precipitate. Um, I don't know if any of our panelists want to comment or Perhaps we can get a couple other comments first. I think we had China online and then um, the gentleman at the left um, in India, but I will go first to China online if we're able to do that uh, with our technology. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me the floor. I'm from State Post Bureau of China. Just now, our moderators and the panelists shared your views with detailed presentations. They're informative and thought-provoking. Concerning this theme, I'd like to put forward two questions to seek opinions from our panelists. Up to now, 13 new members of CC have been approved. As of July 1st, 2022, six thematic chapters have been established to complement the new structure of CC. 
So my first question is, how should we understand an enhanced CC? Uh, some CC members provided comments for other structure in their responses to the questionnaire sent out by the TF. And my second question is, what is your opinion on the proposal to place the CC under the POC? Thank you. Uh, thank you, China, for those questions. I think I'm going to go to the other uh, speakers who wanted to intervene. And um, uh, I would just flag we only have 15 minutes uh, remaining, but I, those questions are extremely pertinent. And as you'll see in our presentation this afternoon, that is really, those questions are where our open discussion is going to focus. So I can't guarantee you we're going to be able to give you a detailed answer in the next 15 minutes, but thank you for putting it on the table and be assured it will be addressed uh, part of suite. Uh, so I think we have the gentleman here and then India. Uh, I see the United States and Italy as well, and I'm probably going to have to close the list there um, and France. Uh, but again, be aware that uh, our colleagues in panel two are awaiting their turn, and we, we have two hours this afternoon as well. So, sir, the floor is yours. And please, I'm sorry, I can't see totally well, so if you could identify yourself. Je suis uh, Aliyun Issa. Je suis le directeur général de... I'm the director general of Mauritania Post. My name is Avi Issa. I listened very carefully to what was said here this morning by the various experts who have spoken and made presentations. I think everything that has been said is extremely important and I really share the views that have been put forward and the goals that have been set. But the fact is that in Mauritania we don't have the same facts on the ground as in other parts of the world. Yes, we know that things are changing very quickly. Yes, we know that we have new realities to face, but certainly in countries like mine, we have huge challenges to overcome every single day. And we really are going to have to look very seriously at how we operate if we are to be able to continue in future and to achieve the kind of goals that have been set. Given the reality of the hardships we face today and given the reality of the competitors we face today, we, developing countries like my own, have huge problems to overcome. And we must recognise that the post is not a priority for our countries because we have so many other problems to deal with. So, given where we are right now, in the middle of a very, very difficult situation where we have unfair competition from a number of other players in the postal sector, and I'm talking about players coming from developed countries, we really are in an extremely challenging situation. I noted what uh, Jean-Paul Forceville said, and he said that uh, as posts we employ a lot of people. That's certainly the case in your country. And it's certainly the case in my country also. We're a major employer, but that's not the case for our competitors, for these uh, private sector operators who are coming into our country. They don't have the same problems of having to pay wages, having to pay uh, national insurance contributions and so on. They really don't have the kind of problems that we have. So I would just emphasize that developing countries today are finding it increasingly difficult to guarantee any kind of universal service. And the problems are just piling up. And as I say, this is not a top priority for our governments. I don't have an answer to all this. I'm just flagging the fact that we have real problems and we need real solidarity if we're all be able to all going to be able to move forward together thank you thank you for those comments uh, that's an important reminder that we all approach this issue from different positions and what we're doing in the upu is trying to find a solution that uh, can reflect all of those different so situations and be tailored to it uh, so that will also be food for thought um, I will go to the other inter, uh, others who have requested the floor, then give our panelists a brief moment to speak. I think India was next on my list. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Let me identify myself. My name is Sandeep, and I'm from Department of Post, Ministry of Communications, India. And while setting the stage, uh, you said that the opinion expressed here are not of governments or operators, and I use that liberty. 
So, uh, so let me be open and uh, let me agree to the first comments of John Paul that we may be, we should be taking that thing out of mind that UPU is closed as of now. And maybe we are open, we are encouraging players to come in. And maybe in 2023 or 2024, when we move to the 150th year celebration of setting up of the union, we may have to take this psyche out of our minds and be very clear that the union is open for all. Because in the personal experience, no open institution has been able to thrive. So the question goes to consultative committee. First of all, uh, let me congratulate. You have uh, doubled the membership in the last one year. And along with that, you did made a statement that none of the rapporteurs in consultative committee, they are not belonging to the market giants. That brings to the question, are the market giants whom we uh, have, whom we are cautious about joining the UPU and disru disrupting our market share, are they really interested in joining the UPU? And that does come from a genuine concern when we uh, went out with the survey. Just giving an example, and it may little bit coincide with the second panel also. We have been discussing intensively on opening up of IMPC codes to wider postal sector players. But when we went out with the survey, majority were not at all interested in opening up of IMPC codes. The Sorry, can I ask? Um, I think that topic, let's bring up in yep. the second panel. Yeah. I think that will So be uh, I will relate it as possible as it with the first panel's discussion. That came out with the conclusion that whom we are dealing with, uh, calling wider sector postal players, are, uh, or whom we are cautious about, are they really interested in joining the activities of the UPU? That will be the question to the consultative committee. And one takeaway from this conference can be that many governments are sitting here, many regulators are sitting here. So when we go back to our own countries, we can encourage the academia or those market giants to come and be a part of consultative committee and take active participation in the activities of the UPU. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sandeep. That's a very good question. I'm sure Walter has noted, and we'll come back to it in a moment. I'd ask each of the three additional countries I have, uh, again, you're not speaking for your country, but uh, I'd ask you to be brief, and then I'll give the floor over to our panelists for a brief comment, and then Samir will close the proceedings. So Italy, please. Thank you for giving the, the floor. I try to be uh, clear and brief. Um, I have, but I have three questions and three concerns. Um, I'm Alessandra Bellanca from the Italian government and uh, the Italian ministry. So I have to, uh, to, to show the uh, government native point of view at this stage. Um, I um, really appreciate the structure of the uh, consultative uh, committee, but I have some concern about that because I think that uh, you talked about the independency from the UPU members, and uh, uh, this is what you said, and I want to understand uh, independent from what and from who, because uh, the, at the moment uh, uh, the governative and the uh, regulatory uh, entity are independent from the rest of the uh, operators. And uh, the second thing is that uh, you talked about postal players and uh, on in the, in the other side, the, uh, wide po uh, the, the wider postal sector players. And uh, my concern is at this stage if there is an opposition between the two parties and not uh, an, or a parallel work. So if the, um, the, the work in the consent, consultative committee will be in opposition or in a parallelism and not uh, in the same way of the uh, UPU works. And uh, at the end, uh, the, the, my primary uh, concern is that we are probably missing something on the way, so the postal service, the universal postal service, because UPU is the universal postal union, and because uh, the governative perspective is uh, the interest of the community, not the interest of the operators, not the interest of the economical market. It's something different. We have to understand if the, the, private, uh, post, the, the private sector is also a postal operator, or if they are not interested in becoming postal operators, 
what, what is the interest to have from the, uh, about, uh, from the part of the, the postal perspective to have uh, private um, operators is not uh, only a service for delivery, but is a postal service. And I want to save this uh, image of uh, UPU and the postal constitutional service and guarantee. Thank you, I'm sorry. No, thank you. Those are very important questions and uh, they link to our presentations this morning, but will also relate to what panel two does. Uh, we'll take those as well. Uh, I see we are fully going to consume our time and even perhaps a little bit more, but we are gonna try to end and do remember we're gonna have all afternoon to continue the discussion and exchange among ourselves. Um, let's see, I think uh, we have the US and France and then we'll close things uh, with brief comments. Uh, David, please. Yeah, speaking uh, as an individual and not for the U.S. government regulators or a designated operator, uh, I would say that if you actually look at the numbers um, from the survey, there was actually very significant support among government regulators and, and wider sector postal uh, players for a robust business council. That's the first point I would make. Uh, Jean-Paul noted in the 1960s that the POC was created to give a voice to designated operators. Um, I think in the 2020s, a big voice, a meaningful voice needs to be given to wider sector postal, excuse me, wider sector players, in particular, non-designated operators. Uh, the metaphor used was uh, the UPU has not been closed, but I would modify that metaphor to say that the, the door has been opened, but the crack has been about a centimeter wide, and there's only a little bit of light coming in the door needs to be opened much wider, a meter wide, and having a meaningful voice for outside players. Now, what that means concretely remains to be determined. Uh, I, I believe that the Consultative Council was created in 2004 uh, through the last 18 years. It had on average a little bit over 15, maybe 18 members. That's an extremely small number. By contrast, the, the ITU, International Telecommunication Union, has had over 900 members. That organization has not collapsed by opening wide and having a meaningful voice like a business council. They have a council structure which is like a business council. They don't have a CC, they have a business council. It's a dynamic organization that works well in partnership between the equivalent of designated operators and wider sector players. So I would make a plea that as we consider how to strengthen the operations of the Consultative Council, that it be given a meaningful role in allowing a voice, not just necessarily via the rapporteurs, but a direct opportunity for outside sector players to have a voice going directly to both the CA and the POC. This union will not collapse if they have an outside voice. That will only strengthen the union. Thank you. Thank you, David, uh, for those thoughts. And we are getting a good range of metaphors in our, in our presentations today. So I thank you all for that. And uh, again, our discussion this afternoon, you, you made some comments about the Business Council, what you thought an enhanced consultative committee should look like. That's going to be our focus this afternoon, is where we're coming out in the task force in our report, the right place on institutional reform. Has it addressed the concerns some of you uh, identified on, on various sides. So uh, that's where we will continue, I think, at 2.30. Is, uh, and I think Fareed, you asked uh, for the floor. Oui. Oui, merci. Thank you, Stuart, for giving me the floor. I'll be uh, very brief because everything I wanted to say has already been said, uh, particularly by my colleague from Mauritania. Um, so I won't take very long at all. Um, so rather than picking up each point one by one um, and at the risk of offending my American colleague who's just spoken because he's already said to me a, a number of times in the task force, uh, we've been talking about this for 20 years, um, I would still like to say, given 
how we're short we are for time, uh, act to actually raise the issue of time. We're here at the UPU, Universal Postal Union, uh, which has those three words, universal, postal and union. Um, I don't want to see it come uh, union for universal business. Um, I don't want to really go there today. Uh, um, I believe it is possible for the UPU to operate with a, a role for business at its heart. Um, no, I wanted to talk about time. It's a, it's a scarce resource for postal operators. Um, we're asked to move as quickly as we can. Uh, we're being asked overnight to compete against the private sector, um, to develop a business model um, when we have a number of challenges uh, such as the huge number of um, public employees we have normally with the second largest public employer after education. So with all of these challenges, uh, there's a lot to be aware of. We're being asked to change our business model uh, to compete with those who aren't subject to the constraints that we have, um, universal service, inclusion, inclusive financial services, etc. Uh, we're being asked to be as effective as the private sector, but um, they're obviously hampered, constrained by so many factors that the, the private sector isn't. And in all of this, time is key. Um, it's necessary to adapt the BIDIS model, um, while at the same time, uh, we understand that time is the scarcest resource um, for anybody trying to make these changes. Um, the private sector is a lot freer to operate within these constraints. It's not so difficult for them to move swiftly. As Jean-Paul reminded us a moment ago um, about the extraordinary Congress, I I'd actually suggested at one point that we have an extraordinary Congress dedicated solely to this um, because it would be good to have a dedicated space and time to actually talk about it. It's not really a typical topic that we could deal with um, in one or two meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Fareed. Um, again, a lot of food for thought. Uh, we are unfortunately at the end of our time for this morning and we don't want to uh, overrun. We want to have time on products and services. So I'm going to close the discussion there. And with apologies to the panelists, I'm not going to ask you to respond right now. Perhaps you can reflect over the next hour or two. I will give you the opportunity this afternoon uh, to address, we've heard a number of points, uh, questions from Italy, uh, China, comments from the United States, France, India, others, uh, Mauritania, ask you to uh, respond to those points that have been raised. And um, we'll start there and then we'll have hopefully as robust a discussion as we've had this morning. But I would ask Samir uh, to, uh, for his thoughts and his closing comments as we wrap up this first panel. Samir, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stuart. Merci. Uh, je tiens à... Thank you, Stuart, and I would like to thank everyone who's participated in the discussion this morning. I really thank those who made presentations. They were of very high quality, and I also thank all of those who made comments. I just wanted to take up a couple of points. I was particularly struck by what was said by our colleague from Uni Global and also the comment from the chair of the CA, my dear friend Isaac. I noted also what was said by my dear friend from France. And what I wanted to emphasise is this. Wider postal sector players is a term that includes universities, uh, research bodies. It's not just private postal operators. It's everyone who's involved in any way in the sector or in the supply chain. Everyone who in any way is involved in the provision of postal services. I wanted to make that point. 
Secondly, on this issue of the use of the term opening up, we're talking about opening up the sector today. Now think about our union. Think about it as a building. It's like a building where you have one big door, you get into the building, and then to go to different apartments, you have lots of little doors. Now, you can say today that the main door to the building is open, but some of the doors getting you into particular apartments are still closed. That's my second point. My third point, I would like to reassure everybody that all of the questions and comments that have been raised were very valuable, but many of them will be clarified this afternoon, where we go on to have more explanation of the outcome of the work done by the group. That's it for now. I hand it back to you. Thank you, Samir, and thank all of you for your attention and your participation and questions. You've given us a lot of food for thought for this afternoon. So. Uh, come back as, as Raz suggested Tuesday uh, Tuesday in our C2 meeting, you know, with knives sharpened and grilled plan warming to, to continue the discussion. So thank you. Sorry.
I, I'm not sure. Oh, no, that way you and I can talk with each other. Okay, fine. There we go. Hey, Will. Don't, don't, don't forget that. I will change you. Huh? You're 
Oh yeah, I saw it. Okay. I was impressed. Why? It was. Uh, it was just beautiful, like everything coming out of Italy. It's like uh, so much virtuosity, and elegance. We, we were just in time like that. You know? Unbelievable. Yeah, and you saw All right, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's get started. If you would all take your seats, please, and uh, hook in, grab yourself a coffee or a cup of tea, a glass of water. Let's get started. Not me. Donc, euh, je vous souhaite euh, la bienvenue une fois de plus. It's me. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. It's me.
这个是这个变绿了呢，你在试一下，哎，这个呢？这个能说吗？Hi, testing, testing the mic here. Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're almost ready to go. So we'll give people just 60 seconds more to take their seats, and we'll get started on this discussion on the second piece of business that we have. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for returning, and thank you very much to our first panelists for running a very interesting panel and very interesting discussion. So, uh, Samir and Stuart, thank you very much. We're now going to move on to a discussion regarding UPU products and services. But before doing that, I'd like to introduce myself to you, and then turn the floor over to my co-chair. I just have a few or brief remarks. My name is Raj Venugopal. I'm coming from Canada, and I'm one of the co-chairs of Committee Two of the Council of Administration. Now, just to start off on maybe a bit of a lighthearted note, our chair of the POC had made the comment that he was urged to be himself. I'm here to tell you that I was urged to do the exact opposite when I, I told my wife we were coming and doing this regulatory conference, and and I said, you know, should I be myself? And she said, Raj, do not be yourself. I I've, I've been. It's been told to me once that if you can imagine, you know that that movie Pirates of the Caribbean. If you take Captain Jack Sparrow and put him in a suit and tie, that's what you have as your moderator. So let's have some fun today, and let's really get into the subject matter and, and enjoy ourselves. Now, one of the four worst words I suppose anyone can hear in a relationship is, "We need to talk." But, ladies and gentlemen, we really do need to talk. We have an extraordinary Congress coming up in 2023, and as our co-chair, our chair from the United States, mentioned, we have a lot of work to do in front of us. And this discussion, not just on the structure of the UPU, but the products and services that we wish to open to the wider postal sector, we really need to understand each other, and we need to come to some very solid understandings on what we agree on. And just as importantly, what we disagree on. So, in this session, and over the next,、uh, well, between now and 1:15, I urge you: ask your questions. Do not temper them. Do not make them polite, and do not make them diplomatic. Make them cutting. Ask your question, and if you don't get an answer, or one of our panelists, or even each other, if they don't answer your questions, or if they say something that perturbs you. Follow up, press them on it, get an answer, and make sure that all of you leave here with at least a better understanding of what we're talking about when we talking when we talk about opening the union to the wider postal sector. Now, I want to urge you to think about four questions. The first is whether you're inside the UPU or outside the UPU or somewhere in between. What is it that we do well? That those that are seeking to engage with the UPU, what is it that we're doing well, that you want in with? And then the second question, of course, the other side of that is, what are we doing poorly at the UPU? Where are we messing things up, in your opinion? Where are we getting it wrong, with regards to the types of products and services we have? And then turning the question back to our colleagues who are outside of the UPU. Um, the question for you, of course, is just the inverse. What are you doing well that you think that we should learn about, and we should engage, and that you can give us, you can sell us, you can license to us, whatever? And what is it that you're doing poorly, or you want to do better, that you're coming to us for solutions with? So those are the kinds of questions, ladies and gentlemen. And before I turn it over to Nedmin, 
Uh, I want to ask you, uh, for, the present, for the people that are doing presentations, we've asked them to keep the presentations tight and keep them short. But in the same regard, if, they are, if they've put the time in to prepare for the session and they're keeping their presentations short, you folks have to keep your questions short and razor tight as well. So let's make sure if we could get 50 questions back and forth, I think that would be a success. So with that, Nirmin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Raj. I am Nirmin Hassan, Head of International Cooperation, Egypt Post, and also I represent the Egyptian government and the Council of Administration, and I would like to serve as the co-chair uh, of Committee 2, Policies and Regulations, and also I have the pleasure to serve here as a moderator. As uh, my dear colleague uh, Raj said, uh, be yourself, being openly. I believe Raj cannot be anything but himself. <laughs> so do I. So. Uh, this is a very good chance where you are expertise from different regions of the world, have the chance to talk about a very important topic with a crucial for the future of the Boston network. So you are not speaking here as member countries, you are speaking here as expertise from the designated operator, from the regulators, from the government, from the wider postal sectors, and speak. Speak about the potentials that you have or the concerns that you have openly because this is a golden chance for all of us to speak openly, of course, politely. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to speak about a very important topic that it has to do with the postal network that as uh, our dear uh, PUC chair said, we inherited a culture in this union. And this culture is, has to do with serving our societies and our citizen. And one of our uh, guests, uh, William, that uh, I'd like to welcome him, will show us a wonderful presentation which is sophisticated, as our union is sophisticated, because our union is huge and is presenting a lot for our countries and our nations and our societies. And this structure, because it's huge and has two faces, one is international face, which is our supply chain, our regulations, our mail system will operate in a standard way across the globe. At the same time, we have this country specific services and features offered to our citizens to address their needs, to be affordable as bear their economic levels. So this network operates magnificently in these two directions. At the same time, there is a lot of chances outside. So it's a partnership. What we can give two directions, no cherry picking, win-win situation, to come together and to develop successful business model between the private operators and the government entities. At the same time, to keep the ship of the Boston network walking in a stable and balanced way. Of course, we know the resolution of Abidjan, it's about the gradual approach, step-by-step -step approach, and here are the products and services which are the tools that we serve our community. And I would refer back to also the PUC chair when he said that the PUC is important for the postal network, is important for the development of postal services, for innovation. So I believe the CC can play a role to be efficient and to contribute to a successful business model with the Universal Postal Union. So here we're looking forward for discussion, how to make the balance, how to make a win-win situation. Please speak openly about the concerns and the values, and this will come. Raj, I give back the floor back to you. Okay, thank you, Nermin. If we can go to the first slide, please, for the delegates. All right. So here's, here's what our task is today, just in this part of the conference. This second theme, so the first session, we talked about the structure of the UPU. We heard from some guests. And our, our guests today are going to be speaking about the second work area that we have, which is looking at products and services. So what we're doing in this session is hearing from our four panelists on the list of products and services of the UPU and hearing their thoughts under what terms under which they might access those UPU products and services that are targeted for opening up. So those are really the two tasks. And if you look at the screen uh, up, uh, well, I guess behind me and on either side of the room, 
you'll see exactly what we're doing. Now, the reason that we're asking these questions are pursuant to two Congress resolutions that were passed at the Abidjan Congress. The first was Congress Resolution C-10-2016, actually that was Istanbul, sorry, and then C-11-2021. Uh, so uh, let's get to it. Uh, let's, let's have a robust discussion on, um, on your thoughts, your views, your concerns, and uh, let's have that discussion. By the end of this session, and by the end of the t today, I hope that we can have a more nuanced understanding and perhaps a more sophisticated understanding of your identification of opportunities, of areas of potential collaboration, of pitfalls and risks. We heard the gentleman from Mauritania speak about some of the risks that opening up has in terms of the structure. There's also risks and opportunities with regards to the products and services. So that's the whole point of this discussion, is to have that robust discussion. So Nidmin, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Raj. Uh, well, for uh, the access to UPU products and services, we also we are going to address opportunities and challenges. Uh, so, uh, we ahead of us, as we said, it's, there is our opportunity and challenges for granting access to wider postal sectors, to the Universal Postal Union, impacts on the postal sector, but not limited to um, uh, sorry uh, on all I, uh, on all the aspects of uh, the postal sector, but not limited to universal service uh, obligations, interoperability, interconnection, pricing, service features of postal products to also examine the demand and the value of postal uh, sector players uh, for access to UPU products, modalities of access such as uh, possible models of access, terms and conditions of access. So this will be the scope of our discussions today. And uh, let's start, Raj, with our first uh, panelist. All right. So, uh... <laughs> Ask for a round of applause. No, I'm not, we're not going to ask for a round of applause. He wanted a round of applause before he even started. As I said, you have to earn your applause. All right, so let's, let's work these guests hard. So our first uh, guest, ladies and gentlemen, is William Lee. He is the Assistant Director of Postal International Engagement with Australia's Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development, Communication, and the Arts. Now, Will's got a lot of uh, other biographical information here. I'm not going to read those, but I'm going to ask you two questions, Will. One is, just tell us something about yourself that might be off the menu. And um, what are you looking to get accomplished today? What would mean a success for you as being a panelist with all of these folks here today? Uh, try this one. And if it doesn't work, we have another one. You have to power it on. There we go. Yes, excellent. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Raj. Uh, look, to answer the first question, um, I'm probably a fairly bad Australian. I don't like Vegemite. So for those that are trying to translate that, that's like our national spread that you would put on toast. Um, I don't like chocolate, so I'm struggling in Switzerland, but we also have Tim Tams, which are our national biscuit. Um, and I'm not a big animal lover, so snakes, spiders, kangaroos, and koalas don't, don't uh, go well for me. So um, that's probably my answer to something that you probably wouldn't know about me. Um, the other element uh, to what is success today, I think for us, having a good conversation, having an understanding of what we are talking about, what are the frameworks, what are the things we need to be thinking about, and how we can move the conversation forward to our extraordinary Congress next year. That, for me, if we, if we can at least start a dialogue that is framed around the key issues that we need to take forward as governments, as designated operators, as part of the wider sector, then I think we've achieved our mission today. So thanks, Raj. Well, why don't we run right through your presentation? Yeah, let's do it. Excellent. Well, I'll move over here for the presentation. Ah, excellent. Thanks very much. Excellent. We've got the slide up. Cool. Excellent. Well, thank you, colleagues. Uh, bonjour. Je suis désolé pour mon français. I apologize for my French. 
It's not very good. Guys, for the translators, if uh, they've struggled to translate even my bad, uh, my bad first line. Um, so look, while speaking from a government perspective today, um, I want to emphasise that the views are mine alone. They don't necessarily represent the views of the Australian government or our designated operator. But I think it's important to start and say that since 1874, the UPU has served a vital role for governments, bringing us together to facilitate communication between our citizens. And I think that mission remains as important as ever today as it was back in 1874, even as the services our citizens demand change rapidly. And as that demand changes, every government that I have spoken to faces the same challenges. Rising demands for quality parcel services from our citizens, declining letter volumes, limited government budgets, a, a rising number of domestic providers, a need for resilient supply chains and workforces to support those supply chains, and the question of how do we support those in regional and rural areas enjoy the same benefits, whether that's connectivity or e-commerce, as those in our cities. So how does this relate to products and services? Products and services are our tools. And to go with the theme of uh, doors and houses today, just might, like you might use a hammer and a nail to build a house. And we have our UPU house, but our house is old and there are at least for some better houses next door. So the data we saw yesterday in CA Committee 3 clearly shows this. With every shock, the postal sector becomes under even more strain. So if we do nothing, we risk leaving some of our citizens behind. We risk not being able to support our mission of connecting the world. We risk leaving our DOs behind. So we need to change, we need to renovate. And like any renovation, it will take time. It's a step-by-step -step approach. But step-by-step -step requires, as my colleagues from Kenya so excellently put the other day, a new destination to head towards. So how do we determine this destination and therefore what tools we need to get us there? The starting point is of course to understand what your tools do. And I really wanna thank Austria and Uruguay for their excellent work so far to build up this knowledge base. And I wanna build on that in my remarks today. I wanna to explore very briefly the various factors governments are balancing and highlight how these relate to the discussion around products and services. And there are really six levers that we have, and these are the six levers that are on the diagram above or oh, behind me. Social development, the obligations of member countries, sovereignty and our treaty interactions, our supply chain and citizen demands, our governance and our product services, and I would add to that our standards. These are not new concepts they are directly linked to the constitutional mission of the UPU that every government has adopted. And you can see in the little boxes on the slide how each of these relate. But they are also interlinked. They are the levers we as governments have available to pull. Our tools, our products, services and standards, they are one part of the puzzle, but not the only part. They are win-wins out there. But there are rarely singular choices that solve everything. Like most other problems, governments can and need to pull lots of levers together, step by step, towards a defined destination. And this is how we make meaningful change. So to dive briefly into these factors and to first focus on the first one, social development. It's an important responsibility and it can take many forms. The benefits post receives under customs, the benefits under ICAO or the IMO treaties, our unique remuneration system, membership fees from member countries and designated operators, and the technical support and the development assistance that the UPU itself provides through the budget and through voluntary contributions. From my perspective, postal social development benefits the entire postal system and we need to help those that are going through the transitions that we've already heard about this morning. 
And indeed, we heard at S0 our colleagues from Senegal raise genuine concerns about the reduction of social development assistance. And I think those comments show that our system is currently funded in an unstable way. And we may, as governments, want to create a more stable and consistent form. Our products and services help facilitate that, but it is ultimately a choice for us as governments on how we're going to deliver. The next question I would ask is around one of scale. We've heard about the shocks that our sector has faced and the ongoing shift in volume from UPU to commercial networks. Our UPU imposes non-economic costs on DOs, whether that's through delivering last mile, delivering out in the middle of nowhere, or through terminal dues or other mechanisms, QSF. It's no wonder our DOs are expressing concerns with opening up. We heard yesterday about the important role the postal sector plays. In my own Pacific region, the post office performs critical functions beyond delivering the mail. In Australia, for example, over 1,200 communities rely on the post office as their only bank. There's no other bank in town. Our colleague from Papu said it even better on Tuesday when he said that the post is in Africa is more than just a business. So, how do we support these needs? To support the levels of support members are asking for, de despite diminishing volumes, there are really only three basic options. We can generate more social development from less volume, and I'm not quite sure our DOs would be too pleased if we went with that approach. We can cut back and not support those who need it, which actually harms us all. Or we can grow our base and share the load and create a more equal playing field. I would suggest, like we heard from our colleagues from Japan and many others, that we need to grow our base. But that means a major renovation over time to get us there and avoid hurting even further our overburdened DOs. Our products and services are one way to bring more people to the table, but not the only way. The final component on social development is around who receives it. Is it our designated operators? Is it at our citizens directly? Or is it our member countries? Who is best placed to support social development? I won't dive into that question, but I just leave that one with you. The second component I want to talk about is around member country obligations. So for those following on the slide, we've ticked from 12 o'clock to about two o'clock. The UPU's mission is to form a single postal territory for the exchange of postal items. And to achieve this, countries have agreed to impose various obligations on one another. The most obvious of this is our universal service. Canada, at the 1999 Beijing Congress, summarised it best when they said member countries need to give the world community a full guarantee that universal service will be provided at the world level. Now, I've been asked whether opening up products and services will impact the USO. And I would just say as an obligation on member countries, it is up to each member how they wish to implement the USO on their territory. It is not up to any government to tell any other government how to do this. But by the same logic, why should any government prevent any other government from implementing an approach that works best for them? Governments have committed to equality of access. By this, I mean you can present any postal item to the border of another country, and that country will arrange its delivery within their territory. So what threatens the USO is the changing needs of our citizens itself and our unwillingness to bring in all the participants that can serve as that need for governments. To safeguard the USO, the question then is really what intergovernmental framework, and our products and services are key to this, ensures governments can continue to decide domestically how best to deliver on their USO commitment for their citizens as part of a globally interconnected network. So whilst I suspect governments are not inclined to reduce our UPU obligations to each other, it does not mean we cannot work together to make new commitments to each other 
new safeguards, new ways of collaborating, and this may be one lever, connected with our products and services, using our products and services as tools to create win-wins over time. The third component that I want to talk about briefly is around sovereignty and treaty obligations. The UPU's role is to provide a functional framework, outline the common rules. And the starting point for that is the sovereignty of our members. And this is why, for example, the designation of designated operators is a member country responsibility. But in some cases, countries have agreed to voluntarily give up some of their sovereignty. Some examples of that are the World Customs Organization Kyoto Convention. Post enjoys a special arrangement there. The ICAO conventions, the IMO convention, and as Egypt has previously highlighted to us, countries also have obligations under the World Trade Organization and the General Agreement on the Trade in Services. These are important obligations for members. Under these obligations, members agree in other forums what the trade rules of the world will be. Our role here at the UPU is to decide who they apply to. And I think one example, drawing this back again to products and services, is our remuneration system. As we heard on Tuesday, this has been in place since 1971. The international trade system has changed a lot since then, and many academics would suggest our remuneration system doesn't actually align with WTO rules. So why do we, as governments, continue to allow these arrangements? I think the answer is, looking at our diagram again, to support social development. But social development for letters. We are now needing to support social development for parcels and e-commerce. And this may mean needing to reconsider how we set these levers up for the new world. When we choose to make an exception to our sovereignty in the interests of, global, of the global community, we need to ask continually for what purpose? Who should benefit from, benefit from it? Why and how do, what do we as governments get in return? Now, I'm not saying we need to remove these arrangements. However, using my example, when we consider social development, does our remuneration system remain the best way to achieve it? And is it aligned to modern needs? We might actually, for example, be able to pull these levers in a different way and give our DOs more flexibility and actually generate more money for citizens and designated operators and others to access the services of the future and use our tools in new ways and create a win-win for everyone and an approach that perhaps removes some of those market distortions we currently have. Now, I don't know about this, but I put it out there to think about. Our sovereignty and treaty obligations as UPU members is one lever we have at our disposal to realign the world of the UPU with the needs of our citizens. The next is around supply chain integration and the citizen experience. Our job is to satisfy customers' changing needs and our, indeed our customers' needs have changed. We have heard many members, including my colleagues from China, highlight the need for service equality, security, supply chain resilience and oversight. And we have heard from the private sector that they struggle with a patchwork of regulatory environments, a lack of uniform standards, a supply chain where everyone operates to their own terms, and a lack of coordination and integration points. And our DOs are saying to us that they cannot provide the services that consumers want and this is shrinking their market. And mandatory tracking is a great example here. Some members want it, some members do not, and some members simply do not have the infrastructure for it. So what do we end up with? An outcome that's the worst outcome for everyone. And even if I want to offer that service, the only way to do it is to go outside the UPU. So as governments, we have created these two parallel networks one that's tied to the UPU social development mission, and one that isn't. Our citizens do not care for such distinctions. They just want their item delivered quickly, at the right price, and with the right features and services. They would ask why all these players, suppliers, delivery partners, and governments can't simply get together around the table and work it out. For governments, and I hope I speak for all governments, 
we wish to have efficient trade on an equal playing field. UPU's products and services facilitate that, but only as far as they remain relevant to the demands of our citizens. And for the governments in developing countries, and our colleagues from Mauritania just reminded us about this this morning, the challenges of navigating these complete competing markets when you yourself as the government are not on a level playing field to support your citizens and to regulate these markets differently, I can only imagine is an incredible burden. For suppliers, there's a mix, mix of systems that add costs to what are essential services. Now, I'm not saying competition is bad, actually quite the opposite. I think we need to preserve a freedom of choice, a freedom our citizens have now. But we cannot ask our designated operators to work with a handicap either. So again, governments can pull different levers together to create win-wins. And our products and services are a tool that can help bring people together, improve our supply chains, and improve our citizen experience. The next component on the uh, Gantt chart on the slide is around governance. And I know we've talked about that this morning, so I won't dwell on that, but I just flag that it is a tool we have at our disposal. And then finally, the product services and standards itself. So we're back to about 10, 11 o'clock. The UPU is our preeminent standards body for the sector. And I think most governments would agree that it should remain so. And indeed, our standards are probably already open in a sense. If our, if our commercial colleagues came to me and said, we wish to adopt all the UPU standards for our internal business, I don't think I would say no, and I don't think the UPU would sue them either. The, so the thing that's really probably closed is the ability to integrate with other players, not just the standards, but to be able to use the standards with others. The ability to access the products and services every player has to offer, DO, commercial, or our suppliers on the same terms, using the UPU's products and services as an intermediary. To open this, we need to balance out the costs for designated operators in the wider sector. Opening up a subset of products and services without a clear plan is really unlikely to address these longer term structural issues that our colleagues from Malaysia, Uruguay, and many other governments that I've spoken to have raised. And to recognise, we also need to recognise the investment our designated operators have already made into these products and services and their commitment to our social development mission. And this is where some of our other levers, working in harmony, can create win wins by looking at these issues as a whole. So, look, I think I've managed to tick up 15 minutes, so I'll conclude here. For governments, we are balancing these six factors. Our world has changed. Our union needs to change to meet this. And to do so, governments, we need to agree a plan, a destination, one that creates win-wins. That destination might be 10 years away, maybe more, but we need a plan. To make progress, we need to pull each of these levers in a coordinated manner, step by step. We as governments need a plan that does not leave our designated operators behind that does not leave our wider postal sector players behind, that does not leave the commercial sector behind, that does not leave our citizens and our businesses behind, and that does not leave the UPU itself behind. Our products and services are one tool we can have to help create these win-wins. So I would just conclude today by saying governments, I would just ask what is our long-term plan for the UPU? Thanks very much. Thanks, co chair Great job, William. Well, thank you very much, William. That was fantastic. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Nermin to introduce the, uh, the next, uh, our next panelist. <laughs> First, I would like to thank uh, William for such a great presentation and um, sophisticated, as I said, <laughs> very brilliant. 
And now we uh, welcome our second uh, panelist. I believe he does not need any introduction, but I will do. Uh, Mr. Vincenzo Rolio. He's the head of rela international relations uh, with the international authorities uh, and organizations, Post Italiana. Welcome you, Mr. Uh, Vincenzo. We are so happy to have you uh, with us here as one of our panelists uh, to benefit from your expertise about supply chain uh, standards, uh, technology. And uh, Mr. Vincenzo also, he's a uh, co-chair of supply chain uh, for BUC uh, C1, Integrated Supply Chain. And also he's a chair of BUC Task Force, uh, who is working on uh, examining uh, the product and service uh, to be opened, uh, UPU product and service to be opened. And he shows a great, su a great support to the work of committee to CAC2. Uh, Mr. Fuchenzu, um first, uh, you have the floor to make any presentation about yourself and then uh, to introduce your presentation uh, to our audience. Thank you, Nermin. <clears throat> I think most of you know me uh, because, uh, you know, I'm a kind of person which, uh, you know, like to show itself. Um, uh, thank you also. <clears throat> Thank you also for uh, clarifying my role uh, on top of the others as chair of the POC task force contributing to the CAC2 expert team works on uh, product and services because today I will uh, uh, act and speak as chair trying to deliver the voice of postal operators. Uh, this not only because of my role, but because I <clears throat> strongly think that uh, now here we uh, have to talk about uh, um, what is the uh, impact of uh, uh, this opening up on the whole community and, uh, and then at the UPU level. I, from the uh, intervention with the, this morning, also uh, my friend William uh, said, uh, uh, I mean, expressed some uh, uh, opinions related to the local uh, <clears throat> view of, uh, of the uh, cooperation with the private sector and, uh, and so on. I think now we have to think what are the solutions at the global level leave just for a second what are all the uh, situation country by country because this is already a reality otherwise we didn't need to, to be here you know because in each country cooperation already exists and we might discover maybe later that we are already benefit a, 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 a lot postal operators and the stakeholders and we don't know if tomorrow this benefit will be preserved so all that said, uh, I prepared a presentation for you um, because I think we still need to go into some details. So I will be very granular in terms of product and services, uh, uh, offering you a possibility to reflect on the possible impact. Thank you. Uh, so first slide, please. Okay, so uh, you, I mean. Look into this slide, some of you think this is just sort of uh, inspiration of that uh, plant watering we were provided in life cycle uh, time by time by time, but it's not. This is just uh, a, a storyline from uh, 1999 to 2023, also to, uh, to express a, a, a relative concept that uh, things uh, can be interpreted by the way you see them, from what perspective. Some things, something that uh, 20 years were a long time uh, and uh, 
uh, nothing happened because uh, some didn't want to do anything about uh, uh, giving access to project services uh, uh, of the UPU to, uh, uh, to the required uh, uh, private postal sector. Well, in 2004, uh, the um, uh, consultative committee was created. In 2012, at the uh, Doha Congress, there was the first resolution, resolution C9, already uh, highlighting uh, products and services which uh, were ready to be open to uh, the private sector. And this is a list of products which uh, uh, is something we have already uh, reviewed lately when the, the basket product uh, was uh, refreshed, uh, and we are talking about you know all the all the services uh, which go in the area of digital services, dot post, uh, and, and others. Um, what, what was uh, again uh, reconfirmed in resolution C10 at the Istanbul Congress. Now uh, I don't know why you know there was this resolution, but nothing happened. I don't want to anticipate a question which I will uh, uh, ask later to the consultative committee, but of course this is the reality of things. You know, nothing happened, and the resolution were there. So something anyway <clears throat> happened in the at the end of the Geneva Congress, you know, and then uh, some acceleration uh, on the, uh, this matter was. Uh, uh, was created uh, a lot of enthusiasm by uh, many parties to understand uh, uh, why we're not doing things and looking for the benefit of this operation. In the last cycle, we worked a lot with a lot of nice discuss, uh, discussion and debate, and uh, we will we would uh, uh, with that uh, uh, provide the uh, resolution C11 at the Abidjan Congress, which is something we are now uh, referring to. I know uh, probably I'm annoying for some of you, but uh, it is important uh, to, uh, to know what has been done in the past to look to the future. Likely, uh, Few months ago, there was, uh, you know, uh, some energy, you know, to uh, the uh, the work of the the opening. A lot of things will be done. A consultation uh, was put out, and uh, uh, the AB was very uh, active in uh, elaborating this basket of product and services to analyze and maybe uh, uh, review in the light of. Uh, uh, a new scenario incorporating uh, uh, other stakeholders in the UPO network. Next slide, please. So uh, from the basket, we saw that there were, you know, a lot of services. Because, you know, uh, one of the characteristics which makes uh, the difference between, uh, uh, let's say, Express Courier e-platform uh, and, uh, and others, uh, is that UPU is inclusive in terms of services, you know, and uh, we have a lot of products uh, in the area of financial uh, services, uh, uh, digital services, uh, one of those is the hot post, and I appreciate the fact that uh, uh, from the um, uh, survey, uh, uh, from the wider postal sector, even only 12 answered, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the dot posts were ranked at half of the uh, desire of uh, stakeholders to be part of it. I think we have already, a lot of work was already been done. You know, so I, I'm not worried on the fact that we uh, should worry the fact that we go to the next Congress and we don't know, uh, we haven't done anything. We already know that there are services that uh, stakeholders want and we can work on that uh, as first stage. Uh, as a matter of fact, some uh, uh, from the private sector already are members of the MAB, they are members of DOT Post, 
and we maybe just need to reinforce, but probably there's a body here that should care more about that and maybe push more for those stakeholders to get more into uh, the works of the union. Obviously, along uh, these services, also uh, some, uh, let's say, treaty or facilities were examined as uh, part of these services. Next slide, please. And one of these was the uh, uh, supply chain, and specifically with the reference to the IMPC code and the ETOIS, because you know, sometime you know, someone was uh, uh, putting forward the idea that uh, uh, the IMPC code is something that can be used. IMPC code is just uh, an acronym uh, of uh, uh, a process processing center. You can have a, a, an IMPC code, but you don't do much if you don't have uh, a, uh, access to the uh, network, uh, electronic network of, of, of the EPU and, uh, and so on. So uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, service, uh, um, as it is uh, the real uh, network of the EPU, is of obviously cannot be analyzed by itself, you know. As it was recently um, discussed, uh, services of the UPU in the area of the um, uh, postal services are a little bit as Mikado game, you know. If you touch something, you have to consider the other. So here the example is, uh, if we open the network, giving uh, an MPC code, uh, 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 an access to, uh, to the platform to anyone, we are obliged because of, because of the actual constitution article to process items, you know. It's not, uh, it's not what happens in today in the private sector where there are treaties between uh, stakeholders deciding which product, which services, which area, and so on. Because postal operators are obliged, because of the constitution, to deliver uh, any shipment which is found on their network. So it's just a point uh, uh, to remind that there, are, there is a lot of regulation now which also we should look at uh, when we think that we should uh, give access uh, uh, to uh, actual non-members. Next slide. Okay. Uh, well, you see uh, this slide is uh, composed of two parts. The first one is inspired from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the remuneration document which was analyzed uh, um, among the others in the basket of products and services. And this is a very good example of how we can possibly uh, face uh, uh, this new model in which you don't have only postal operator, postal operator. You have postal operator in a country, postal operator in another country, and all the other stakeholders in same countries. So, which is very fantastic. I mean, everyone is contributing. Everyone can uh, uh, exchange uh, shipment with the others. What, which means that postal operator can uh, deliver to private sector, private sector to postal operator, and vice versa. But of course, also stakeholders to stakeholders. Which, you know, I mean, uh, gives me some uh, point of reflection because uh, now there's a, a little disalignment with the, with the actual remuneration system. Because the actual remuneration system uh, regulates rates at cross-border level, uh, level for delivering in destination country. But don't say anything if that flows go to the rural areas or go to the metropolitan areas. Unfortunately, this division makes a lot of difference for, the, for anyone who operates on the market. Uh, and our friends from uh, the, uh, the private sector do know that very well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, as they mostly operate in metropolitan areas. 
So which are the differences here? Urban area, high, densi high, high, high in intensity, so low distance cost is very profitable because, you know, when you have very short distance, you know, with a small van, you can, you know, I mean, deliver <coughs> uh, tons of, uh, of uh, small packets, for instance. Rural areas is a bit, a little bit different, you know, you need uh, a car, you know, and then it depends, you know, we, 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 um, uh, we were informed of this ranking on best performance countries uh, uh, in the uh, statistic uh, uh, a couple of days ago, comparing the countries uh, without uh, taking into account uh, the geography of the countries, you know. I would be uh, best in Concasi if I was Switzerland or Austria or any other small country. It's different when you are Greece and you have 2,000 islands. So this is the point. Who is delivering to the islands or is the, uh, <coughs> who is delivering to, into Athens? Just for you to reflect. Next slide, please. So just now to try to uh, put all together what I think are the key issues for both the EOs and the wider postal sector. Sorry that my image is cutting a part of the slide, but anyway, uh, the, the, uh, the, the part on the right is uh, referred to the wider postal sector uh, on already incorporated in the consultative committee. So let's look uh, to, to, to this slide. So we have uh, DOs. What, what, what is the main characteristic of DOs? Is it their social role, you know? What, the, the, the relevance of DOs, because they have a, a <coughs> social, social role and proximity. During pandemic, uh, I mean, DOs were the first stakeholders the government was looking at uh, when they had to I mean, to, to issue some special uh, uh, regulation. And when it was the case of the vaccine and others, they just looked to the use. What they have? They have the last mile, knowledge and capacity. Of course, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, a postman is someone known by the by the, the suburb you know anyone knows him he knows how to deliver you know is a you know is a known entity is uh, is the customer for the customer okay what happens in the uh, in the uh, oh, from the other part better quality i mean we can recognize that uh, 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 Express Courier, uh, uh, e-commerce platform now vertically integrated uh, can give better quality than postal operator. And this is the point we now have to see that by the time uh, the POC had its evolution, but also the private sector is uh, uh, its evolution. Now we still have some uh, uh, Korea Express, but the predominance now of adding this new figure, which is platform oriented to business model. So e-commerce platform that they also deliver on the market by themselves. They cooperate, they deliver. Building a new form, which is not cooperation, is not competition, competition but it's competition. Obviously, they are more agile. Why they are more agile? Because they have, they have less regulation, less complexity. Obviously, they, they have also some constraint. Cost, especially related to big sides of our parcel, every, you know, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Express Courier would like, you know, always to deliver a small packet to fill as much as possible in the van and make cost effective. Rural areas challenges, I mean, for you it's a challenge because obviously it's cost and you are looking to the cost more than we are. <clears throat> because you are free. We are not. We, are, we have a social law. 
We, we cannot decide <coughs> to close a postal office. It's the government decide if a postal office can be open or can be closed. In Italy, just to make an example, if you want to close a letterbox, you may do, and then the, <coughs> the rep representative of that area, that they go to the parliament, you know, and say, they, you know, they are just uh, uh, post Italian, you know, is not, uh, 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 let's say, respecting the obligation of the USO. So, is there a level playing field? I don't think so. I see differences. I see some uh, actors which are uh, serving the government as a certain actor which are customer and business oriented, which are trying to make profit in a market which now is obviously shared. So we have, uh, 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 I mean, this is came from our discussion we had uh, with uh, our co uh, members of the POC uh, task force. So we have this customer inclusion, which is typical from the uh, uh, institutional actor, which is the design postal operator, towards a commercial approach. We have uh, the co collaborative network, which is uh, the members, which are the members of the EPU, towards the a competitive network. Now, what is important to say uh, and to highlight is that uh, Global payer from the private sector are already integrated because uh, they don't need to uh, look at how standards are applied in certain countries. While postal operator now, and I can testimony that uh, uh, since I'm serving as co-chair of committee one, which we still are struggling despite a lot of, um, um, let's say, development were done with getting data from IT Mat, you know. Still some country cannot, uh, are not able to give uh, uh, information to make the supply chain functioning, you know. That's, that does not happen for private sector because they have their own standard. It's a little bit like McDonald's. You go anywhere, everywhere in the world, you settle your shop and you say, you sell the same hamburger that, uh, you know, you said in Washington, in Helsinki, in Rome. I mean, it's the same. So that is facilitation. It's not the same for us. We still have to, <clears throat> to, uh, to fight with gaps, which are among 992 countries. Of course, if we speak about Europe, if we speak about uh, uh, design operators in uh, industrial countries which are well, uh, uh, I mean, uh, made on the market, uh, expressing good quality is something, but what about the others? I mean, we are the UPU. We cannot leave anyone behind. We, we have to consider that we are in an organization where everyone has to be on board and everyone has to be considered. And of course, the impact which we still have to study, I remind you, can be very different from country to country, from region to region. I don't want to say more on the USO because uh, is, uh, uh, I've been, uh, you know, uh, accused in the past, you know, of being uh, a defender of the USO. But it's a constraint for postal operator. However, however, it's not, uh, I mean, uh, under the responsibility of the UDOs. This is uh, an issue under the responsibility of regulators and uh, ministries. Because if tomorrow anything will impact the USO, it will be certainly not, you know, an issue for the US, it will be an issue for governments. I'm sure it will be. Next slide, please. So anyway, you know, in the spirit, you know me and I'm always propositive. So I think uh, uh, among uh, uh, this that some of you would uh, have seen as provocative was just what I thought uh, were the uh, 
basic elements which uh, we re re also recently discussed in our meetings, uh, I wanted to share with you to make everyone aware of which are the pillar of, uh, uh, of this network. I mean, obviously, uh, from the perspective of postal operators. I think we can do something, but what do we need here? Do we need two things? First thing we need is a level playing field. If we, we, we just left the previous uh, chart on which uh, I don't think there are the uh, condition for uh, uh, level playing field, and I think uh, our friend from uh, uh, was, uh, Mauritania, I think, before uh, just uh, made a very clear uh, expression of that, you know, saying uh, we are challenging, you know, day by day for trying to serve with, uh, to serve our customer. How can we now uh, compete with someone who has already everything? Come here and impose, you know, it's uh, uh, better quality, efficiency, uh, customer experience and everything. Can we do that? Can we combine? Can we build cooperation between those two parties? Of course, if we enter into a cooperation, we will need the reciprocity. So let's make uh, uh, an example between Post Italiane and uh, my friend Kit Kellison from UPS. Once, I mean, you know, he will be ready to uh, give us some volumes on our network uh, and we have a range on the price which of course uh, will be regulated by the UPU, Post Italiane will be happy also to, uh, to send to them volumes uh, in uh, maybe you know in some uh, uh, part of the world which we have some difficulties uh, uh, with postal operator or, or for, for other logistic means maybe because of, of flight connection and uh, and so on so uh, th these are points what we should keep in mind we know that uh, uh, and Jean-Paul said that before, I mean, uh, we've always been open. The markets are always open, already open. I just talked with the friends in other countries that they say our market is shrinking and the others are doing everything. Let's see whether and think if this uh, process will lead to get back the volumes decline to the postal operator or will accelerate the decline of volumes for postal operator? This is just a question for you, but we will have time this afternoon to answer that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Francenzo. Uh, actually, Raj, we have, uh, I believe our panelists have heard our uh, advice and this spoken openly. We have a regulator who expressed his uh, obligations and his views and designated operator also who expressed his concerns and he's being open to work about win-win situation. And it's time now to listen to our panelists from wider postal sector, but I would like to recall the spirit of the union. <laughs> Because we are 192 countries, we are not on agreement of everything, but we come together and work together and this is the spirit of our union, how we address our concerns, how you address their concerns, how you contribute to it. We are looking forward, right Raj? Absolutely. So this is the, this is the fun part, not that you gentlemen weren't fun, but now we get to hear from, from if I can use the term outside the tent, but you know, I know that there's a link with the consultative committee, but now we get to look and hear from you, um, both you folks who are from outside of the union, technically. Uh, so with that, uh, Kate, I'm gonna give you the option of either starting uh, and, and finishing from either the podium or the chair. Uh, the floor is yours. I'll give you just a quick intro, if that's okay. Uh, we'll welcome our third panelist now, uh, Ms. Kate Muth, Executive Director of the International Mailers Advisory Group, a US-based trade association that represents international mailers and shippers, which has been a member of the CC since 2004. And I think uh, we've all seen uh, the IMAG placard up in the, up in the balcony. I know that you've been attentively watching the proceedings over the last few days. So 
Kate, the floor is yours. If you could just uh, give us any parenthetical comments you have at the beginning, a personal point, and just what you want to get out of this, and the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you, Raj. Thank you, Nermeen, and thank you for the invitation. I would say I will be short, but as you can see, that's not true. I've been told I should say I will be brief. So <laughs> for those online, I'm tall. Uh, so um, I just wanted to uh, highlight here that uh, who our members are, and as you can see, um, we're 45, we're, we're, IMAG is a US trade association, US-based uh, trade association. We represent um, primarily, uh, well, international mailers and shippers, of course, with at least some presence in the United States. Uh, not all of them are, are headquartered there. I think you can see that um, they are uh, partners to the postal, to the postal operators, they are suppliers and vendors, they are your customers, serving the shared customer, and of course they are competitors at times. And we are a very unique association because our members are um, often competitors to each other, but they're partners to each other as well. And the whole goal is to remove the barriers to the efficient movement of goods and information across border. That's what we try to do. We work together. There's a little bit of strength in numbers. Um, if you asked something, you know, we, we've had some metaphors here. I like to use sports metaphors. Uh, I think you, using a boxing metaphor, we're a small association, but we punch above our weight. We have a very, very visible international presence. Um, I just wanted to note that about a third of the members didn't even exist 15 years ago. They weren't even companies. So that tells you how fast and how dynamic the e-commerce industry is. It's brought all of these new market entrants into the, uh, into the, into, under the tent, so to speak. Um, uh, these are all, most of the members are uh, either consolidators, hardware, software solutions providers, they're platforms, they're the marketplaces, and um, they, most of them take advantage, at least in the United States, uh, some of them do inbound into the US as well, but we take advantage of what's called work sharing, which is when, uh, when a mailer or a shipper does the sorting or the transportation or the distribution um, and gets a discounted rate from the postal service because we've taken some of the work away from them. And what we have promoted as an association, both through uh, the expert team and just and our ongoing activities in the CC is this idea of international work sharing where we're trying to build volumes for the postal operators. And yes, there are times when we will use, when the members will use, uh, will use a freight forwarder, we'll use one of the integrators, they'll use direct injection. But the idea is to give, and I heard Will re reference this, to give the customer as many options as possible and to give them you know, the best possible service at the price that they want with the tracking that they want or don't want. So it's the whole, the whole gamut of options because the customer ultimately, you know, for our members, they also take on the customer service part for, for the postal service when they're work sharing. They're the ones who get the customer's complaints and calls. So I was asked to kind of give an example of, um, of, of how we partner. And there's a handful of ways. There's, well, in fact, there's a number of ways, but I'm gonna just share a handful. Some of these members are quite literally uh, what we call, well, they're postal qualified wholesalers. They quite literally sell the postal services products and services. We have the three, um, we have the three PC postage providers. So they are selling postage. We have a number of companies that add value to the, to the um, products that all of you provide and they serve your customers by adding value. We have duty and tax collector um, software solutions. We have labeling solutions and all of it is to you know, improve interoperability to integrate. Um, I just want to tell a couple of other things that we have done. We had a member that during the pandemic provided transport into, um, into Europe for a designated operator when a number of the flights went down. And this was the only way they could get the, uh, get the mail into certain European countries. One of my members provided that transport, but they didn't have UPU documentation. They were they couldn't enter it, you know, didn't have an IMPC code and didn't have UPU documentation. So things kind of got held up when it reached the destination, um, destination designated operator. Have uh, a, a member that facilitated airlift to Latin America from the United States. Had a member that became uh, certified to be an ocean carrier to keep, to keep mail moving and, and goods moving during the pandemic. You know, and that's 
a, quite an undertaking to be certified through uh, the Federal Marit Maritime Commission and Customs and Border Protection, have other members that also in their own countries became ocean carriers to keep mail and goods moving. So these are some of the ways where we are already partnering with, um, with designated operators and of course with the integrators as well, again, to give customers as many options as possible. Uh, we have been an active participant. IMAG has been in the uh, expert group, in the expert team. We've offered comments and suggestions both in written and we've participated on the calls. And we are among the proponents for um, some kind of an integrated service, product or service, because some of the products and service are quite good, perhaps on their own, but they are actually their true value is derived from being interconnected with, with other products and services. Um, so we did promote some of those uh, ideas. And one of the things I mentioned um, last week in Frankfurt at the World Leaders Forum is that a lot of the private sector doesn't even know much about what the um, Postal Technology Center does. They are producing some really quality um, products, but it's just not very well known. And one of the things that uh, one of the things that the private sector can do is to essentially help you market and sell those products and services to reach a wider audience. You know, I, I'm kind of jumping around here because you know, I wanted to respond to everything Vincenzo said, and if I did that, I would, I would be here for another 20 minutes to dispute a number of the things he mentioned, but I don't want to do that. I want to kind of stay on track with where there are some real possibilities for us to continue to work together, together going forward. Um, we have uh, some ideas around what products and services might be worthwhile for what I am going to promote and suggest today, which it would be some market tests. And the concept being very similar to what would be in the private sector. You stand up a couple of services or products for, for a year, two year, you market test, you gather the data, you take that data and you know perhaps I heard some of this reference to how do we model some of this for individual countries. We run market tests and we see what works. If it, after a year or two years, the um, you know agreements between the designated operators and the private sector or the private companies, if something isn't working, all right, you kill it or you, you tweak it, you revise it. If it's working well, we scale it up and offer it more widely. Um, I have a couple of few ideas actually on what those, uh, well, how do we get to a market test? Well, that's another idea that I, I was thinking about and talking with the members. So what if we use the existing expert team, but we create a much smaller, agile, and nimble group within that, like a small working group that wants to be part of a market test. So if you're a designated operator or a, gov a government that wants to consider a market test with a private sector partner, you would be part of this working group. But perhaps we don't want the designated operators that only want to come into a working group to kill every idea. I mean, I think it really has to be something where we are moving the ball forward because a lot of the early slides were showing that we've been talking about this for 30, 20 or 30 years. Started my career as a, as a trade reporter. I covered the postal service, the business of mailing and the UPU. And, you know, I've been doing this 25 years and we have been talking about this for 25 years. So one idea is to just create some market tests and move the ball forward. And then the last thing I will do is suggest a couple of ideas um, for, for some market tests. Um, one is, is an express-like commercial service um, where you would have a post perhaps that doesn't already have a commercial arm. And I'm just gonna use as an example going into the United States, but let's say Japan Post or India Post, and uh, we have a private sector partner that's a platform and the express, and they're the ones that's gonna help you get that express-like service. So you have, you say you have a Japan Post and they're, they turn the manifest over to this platform or the solutions provider. And they're providing, they're lining up the, the service, they're lining up the transport, they're taking care of the whatever piece of it that you need taking care of, the customs clearance, the duties and taxes, and their direct injection into the United States. And they're deciding on the, you know, based on what service you want or what price you want, this, this software solution, this platform can help decide what the last mile delivery provider should be. And then we decide, okay, well, what UPU products and services do we want to lay on top of this? You know, kind of, I've heard um, Walter describe it as this is the, the, the UPU platform is the iPhone and we're putting all the apps on top. 
So do we want to use OSCAR to measure, uh, measure uh, carbon emissions? Are there some track and trace products that the UPU has that would be good for this, for this market test? You know, we can, we can layer in whatever we want, the, the payment system, um, but that would be at commercial rates. We're not asking for market, you know, we, we do market rates. We're not asking for, um, for the remuneration. I almost feel like that's something we could take right off the table from our perspective. So that's one idea. And then referring back to what I had uh, mentioned about the member who was moving, um, was helping a, a post to move uh, mail into, um, into Europe during the height of the pandemic, what if we allowed uh, UPU documentation just so that the, the commercial partner and the post are speaking the same language. They're singing from the same song sheet, so to speak. Uh, so that might be another market test. And then finally, you know, if we did want to look at maybe one or two standalone, the addressing solutions uh, are very intriguing. There is, uh, obviously, it benefits everyone, the, the commercial provider, the post, the, the sender and the recipient, if the address is, is correct and um, clean and correct. I forget what the three Cs are. Uh, current, clean, and correct. Um, but at the moment, those, those tools are a little bit cumbersome. I was looking at what you have to do with the documentation and the guide and the, you know, the exceptions in this country. It's like filling out a tax return, frankly, um, except for apparently in Estonia. I heard Estonia people fill out their taxes in a half hour or something. So, but it's like filling out, you know, lengthy forms where you're, it's very cumbersome and you're just gonna, you're just gonna walk away from doing it. So maybe there's a chance to partner there where, um, where our members, any number of these solutions providers on here could add the right bells and whistles, could customize it for different customers and make it um, have, have a value that's very appealing to a wider, um, to a wider array of, of customers. So with that, um, those are my ideas and suggestions, and I, I welcome any further discussion during the uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. That was great. Uh, I'll turn the floor over now to uh, Nirmin to get our last uh, presenter on deck, and then we can get into it. Um, thank you, Raj. Uh, now we go to our uh, next panelist, uh, Mr. Keith uh, Kelson. Please welcome with me, Mr. Keith. Hello, sir. Welcome uh, to UPU and our uh, conference um, and allow me to introduce to make a brief uh, introduction for you uh, mr keys uh, he's an accountant and a lawyer and started his career as a tax attorney uh, focusing on international structuring operations and later led a team responsible for business development in asia china and india he joined the mail industry uh, in 1990s as the chief financial officer and general counsel of mailing company, which was one of the first work share partners with United States uh, Postal Service. Welcome, Mr. Keys. Uh, first, we'd like uh, you to make a brief introduction about yourself to know you more and then uh, go to uh, your presentation. So. Well, first, I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to present today. Uh, the IB, the Council of Administration and Postal Operations Council, I'm humbled and, and, and grateful for being able to exchange ideas today. Uh, from outside the tent, inside the tent, there's still ideas. And I'd like to exchange those as candidly as we can, good, bad, and indifferent. So don't be afraid to send some tough questions. I'm fine with that. That said, personal points. Uh, number one, I've been doing international for many, many, many years, within the mail industry or outside. My ninth birthday, I was in Russia. Uh, first time in China was 1979. I was 16 years old. And so I like to think that it enables me at least a little bit to understand from looking across the aisle and understanding through different eyes and different perspectives, which is what I'm trying to do in this case and for many years for my career. The other point personal is I have three triplet 20-year-old girls who taught me to be humble and broke, and, uh, and they enabled me to have a, a, a passion for this world that I think I'd like to leave a little better off for them than I was given. So those, that aside, from a successful perspective here, it's exchange of information, it's that simple. Make sure that people understand a lot of things that I've seen just in the last few days, I think are, are unnecessary uh, disagreements. They're just, we need to get the information out there to what we're looking for and where we think we can provide benefits. And then exchange, of course, where the concerns are and how we can address those concerns. And I'm an operator by nature, I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted because I'm a lawyer, an accountant, and an operator, so that just makes me something a mess. But that said, I oversimplify things. I think that it, sometimes we can overcomplicate things that can be quite simple as a whole. Now, the details get messy sometimes, but the concepts don't have to be. And that's what I want to exchange today. 
So that said, as a label, if you will, please, this is, uh, Vincenzo said, the light bulb, inspiration. This is my inspiration. Now that is really sad, right? Either I've been in postal too often, I'm not a techie, so what's wrong with this? Why does this inspire me? This label here, the reason this inspires me, is this label here enables for the two of the largest supply chain networks in the world to exchange packages every day and leverage each other. It allows UPS to exchange millions of packages a day and deliver them to the United States Postal Service every day so they can do last mile delivery to residences in the United States. I'll get into more details on that a little bit more, but labels just like this from several other companies enable the United States Postal Service to deliver 3.5 billion packages last year for the private sector. 3.5 billion, 10 million packages a day right now are flowing through the United States Postal Service network every day because of labels like this voluntarily where the Postal Service is being paid what they think they should get paid. We are paying it willingly and our customers are receiving a shared experience that benefits e-commerce. That's why this inspires me. To cut through the chase, and I'll get into a little bit more detail here, that same label in a simplified version I think can enable the United the UPU to do the same thing with the last country mile being the last mile from a United from an international basis. So rather than the USPS being paid a market rate to deliver something within a geo of the United States, a foreign post is paid a market rate to deliver a package voluntarily in its country of origin. That's a very high level. We'll get into more details here, but voluntary market rates. Those are the themes I want to push on here. And before we get too much into the details, though, a little background. I entered the mailing industry 25 years ago. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, I was a CFO and general counsel of a mailing company that was purchased by UPS. But we were one of the first work share programs of the United States Postal Service. Work share, Kate outlined it, that's where the public works with the private sector and the public sector of the Postal Service to try and create, to use the strengths of our networks, to work together to provide a better customer solution using each of our strengths. When I was at RMX, we had the, the work share program. Again, we were drop shipping to the United States Postal Service 100% of our volume for them to deliver packages on our behalf because they're there and we weren't. United States, UPS Mail Innovation still exists. I ran it for a few years. We were acquired by UPS in 2001. And then I helped negotiate the first work share agreement or first NSA with UPS, the United States Postal Service. And when I went to one of my senior leaders at the United, at UPS in 2001, and I said, someday it may be possible for the Postal Service to deliver a package for UPS, he said, don't say that again or I will get fired. Go figure, right? We have it on both sides. I worked extensively with Jim Cochran with the USPS many years ago. We discussed many times where they were getting obstacles all over the place, fear of the unknown, fear of change, fear of what are they going to do to us. But slow but sure, it caught on. And that program, where again, the Postal Service delivers for UPS and many others, not just UPS, has been the fastest growing parcel delivery program for the United States Postal Service for the last 20 years. So it has been done. And obstacles, internal, external, exist. Yes, people are afraid. I'll go through more details, I'm sure, as the dialogue unfolds this afternoon. But it can be done. And I think from a UPU perspective, it should be done. I think from a, from a UPS perspective, it would be helpful to be done as well. I think it helps us all if we do it right. And that's the key. Everybody in this room has the ability to do it right. We'll get into more details later on. That said, if UPU can be a facilitator of the last mile. Now UPS already delivers to 220 countries and territories every day, 192 of which are represented in this room. We are either using posts, which we do a lot. Most people don't know that. I can't publicize it. But if you don't think we're leveraging posts in a lot of geos, you're crazy. They're already there. So we're already doing this. But I don't have a centralized platform. So 192 agreements, really? 192 barcodes? No. No, that's not an efficient way to do it. To have the ability to deliver through the UPU at a market rate. And that puts the control in your hands. The rates are yours. We don't want the terminal dues. That, but maybe say that twice. I'll say it three times, because I've heard argued 50 times this, 
terminal dues, USO, we gotta do the USO if we force posts to deliver low costs. That's not what we're asking. We are not asking to force a post to do anything. We're asking for any post in this room to say, I can deliver this package in this country to a competitor of yours and pay them a market rate, or I can deliver it to the post and pay you a market rate. It's up to you. If you don't wanna do it, don't. If you do it the first time and don't like it, back out. But at the same time, you have a chance to deliver things at a market rate that hopefully cover your costs. And if you don't, shame on you, raise your costs. Now I'll caution you, the prices have to be competitive because we're already delivering to someone and we can't lose too much money doing it. I like to give post op in, frankly. I think that you have infrastructure, USOs, virtue of the UPU and the post behind it. Give the post the first opportunity, but you have to deliver. And that's okay. Everybody wants that chance to deliver. So that's my perspective at a very high level. I do not want to sit there and govern the UPU. I don't want to take over the UPU. I've got enough governmental issues in DC right now. I don't need to do more of those here. The fact of the matter is though, we want to contribute as a partner, working together to go forward. So uh, the operator at heart again oversimplifies things. There are a lot of concerns here. I welcome those concerns, bring them on. Let's hear them in an open forum so we can address them and go forward. To me, it's as simple as that. Putting it together, a little complicated because you have 192 of those. I got it. I got it. And again, I'm oversimplifying things. But if you had the ability, and this, this involves some of Kate's customers, involves some of Kate's member companies because they have ancillary services that will be plus, minus, or indifferent to that or whatever the posts need as well. So there are some, obviously some challenges. At the same time, though, to me, it makes sense, number one, to whiteboard it so we can get rid of the misinformation. Let's figure out what everybody wants in this room. If it's concerned about terminal dues and re requiring a post to deliver things that made somebody lose costs, take it off the table. That's gone. That never was. I presented a year ago, a year and a half ago. I asked for market rates way back then. So a lot of those debates end right there. Universal service obligation, let's talk about it. It's important. I'm the first to agree with it. But I'd like to think that this program helps fund the USO by giving packages to posts at market rates so they can leverage their infrastructure and deliver something and make a little bit of money to help pay for the USO rather than take away from it. So I'll leave it at that. I thank you very much for your time. I look forward to the engagement. And again, I thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Mr. Keys, uh, for this practical, straightforward, and open uh, presentation. Actually, I have a couple of questions for you, and also for Keith. Uh, it has been active, it's been lively, it's been focused, and we have a practical issues here to speak about. And also, we have issues and concerns related to it. So we're looking forward. I believe it will be for the second session. <laughs> we don't have time to... To, to open the floor now, or uh, we, we can, we can, couple uh, questions. Okay, so uh, we still have 15 minutes ahead of us. Okay, so uh, the floor is open for questions and even uh, take the questions now and we can receive the responses uh, maybe uh, in, in the next session. So uh, Raj, uh, if I may, uh, yeah. the floor is open. How about we go to our colleague from Malaysia? Yeah, thank you, Raj. Thank you for giving uh, Malaysia a uh, floor. Uh, like, I really like uh, Australia, the flower presentation. I think perhaps IB can <laughs> adopt or, or adapt that presentation for the Congress. I think that's, that is something that, that we, we don't need to reinvent. I think a lot of what has been done by Australia, I think is something uh, very useful to, to our works. And we also very impressed with our wider stakeholders, if I can say, in the United States in particular, on work sharing has been done for many, many years in the United States. And it shows that partnership have created a lot of prosperity for all players uh, when you compete as well as uh, you cooperate. I think this is something, uh, the model that we can think globally and UPU could be the, the center or platform for last mile delivery as our friends from United, uh, UPS is, is suggesting. I think the model is there, is something that we need to, to find ways how can we do it right. Thank you very much. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Nermin, for uh, uh, giving me the floor. 
Introducing myself in few words, I'm Radu Moldovan and I have been working in the regulatory authority in Romania, ANCOM, for 20 years, currently leading the postal regulation unit inside it. For beginning, I want to emphasize that I am elated to participate uh, in this event and I consider that the discussions and resolutions of the Abidjan Congress last year, together with the activity of the POC and CA experts in the organization of this conference, as a forum for debating not only involving the expression of official position of the member states, but also the personal opinions of the present representatives, are actually a big step forward in the Union's activity catalyzing process for future. Regarding the portfolios of services accessed by postal services provider, providers other than the universal service providers in member states, we all know that they are interested in providing services outside the universal service in many less developed countries or in developing countries concentrating their activity in the urban environment, mostly because of a lack of infrastructure. I want to correlate this fact with uh, the conclusion drawn following a question from the questioner developed in connection with this subject. Should the wider members have a role in the decision-making process at the UPU? From the answer we received to this, it follows that 23% of the respondents are of the opinion that future members should not be involved in the decision-making process. Interesting, most negative answers came from the world's regions with many less developed or developing countries. In my opinion, this fact should raise a key question also in close connection with some detail, details from Vincenzo's presentation. What are these suppliers afraid of? Why don't they trust in a future of together? Do not the universal service suppliers in the respective states seeing in the opening of UPU some future competition challenges in the very specific postal services market in which they operate? In my opinion, the opening should produce for future the really single global market for postal services and lead to the really interconnection of re regional postal networks from all over the world. I leave the question open considering that in the perspective of next year's extraordinary Congress, better communication is needed between U UPU and the respondents of that 23 of negative answers received to the mentioned question. To conclude, I thank all the panelists in the first two panels of the day for the great presentations they made. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak and I wish everyone in attendance a great day ahead. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, I believe we, we have noticed someone uh, before, the lady from Kazakhstan and the article from Tunisia. You said you... Uh, and Uniglobe uh, was uh, looking for the floor right okay. after Romania, so oh, we can go to Uniglobe and then... Uniglobe, okay. Yeah. Bonjour Thank à tous. you. Merci. Can I begin? Good afternoon to all, and thank you to all of the panelists for their presentations. It was indeed very, very interesting. We represent some 2.5 million workers throughout the world. And my question, or my intervention rather, follows up on that of the intervention from Australia. You mentioned that we need a level playing field between DOs and actors in the wider postal sector. and. For that to be the case, the products and services of the UPU could allow for the establishment of such linkages. And that we need a plan for that, a plan that leaves no one behind. And that plan that leaves no one behind, you spoke about the designated operators, you spoke about the wider postal sector operators and citizens. And I should mention that it is important that we do not leave the workers behind either. They, every day, day-to-day -day do the work and have allowed us at these times of crisis to maintain our links and communication. So how can we also ensure in that that workers are included? Thank you. 
our colleague from Kazakhstan and then to Nature. Thank you, dear colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank all of these speakers for the extremely comprehensive material that they presented to us. And I would like to uh, draw my colleagues' attention to the following point. As we know, membership of the UPU means that we have certain obligations. And I would like to clarify, when opening the UPU to WPSPs and these new participants, will they have rights? And will we be putting some obligations on them? So what do I actually mean by this? Well, the obligations, generally, these obligations lie on, on DOs. So when we include the private sector, will we, will, we mean, will we give these obligations to them as well? And there may be risks in uh, providing these services for the private sector. And so we need to really think about this relation between the DOs and the private sector. That was the first point. And so we really need to think about social responsibility as well, that we ask of our workers. For example, in our company, we have uh, a certain number of workers, and we have to think about uh, the reduction in, we have to think about the social consequences on their work. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Now, uh, Lady from Tunisia, you have the floor. Okay, thank you for giving Tunisia the floor, Madam the Chair. Uh, give me an opportunity to put this away. Uh, my name is Mona. I represent here the government, the Ministry of Communication Technologies. That's why uh, you can here judge that I'm holding both positions as strategy maker and regulator of the market in Tunisia. So from a government perspective, inviting stakeholders uh, to contribute to the achievement of the United Nations sustainable goals, sustainability goals is really in the heart of our mission. Uh, for that, our government has prepared a national digital plan taking into consideration many models of collaboration among which is private-public pa partnership and why not even in plans for encouraging uh, really uh, private investment. Uh, but at the same time as government, maintaining the sustainability of the designated operator is a still a priority as designated operator in Tunisia is the uh, provider of the universal service. And not only that, but also a major player in the implementation of e-government strategy aware about the challenges, I think deciding about the issue of opening up should be dealt with uh, based on a very cautious approach. I concluded from the interventions of all the panelists and the participants that we are dealing with the issue from different positions, regulator, government, operator, different economic and regulatory uh, uh, models, different also level of development of the sector. So as we are already following the recent output of the task force also, we notice that there are three baskets, for example, of products, but does that really serve the implementation of the decision to gradually open up? I don't think so. I think that it rather makes it more complicated and harder to implement. Why? Because for the simple reason I already mentioned it, that we are discussing the issue from different positions, from different economic models, from different level of, uh, uh, of development. That based on such conclusion, I may here ask all the audience, the panelists and partic participants, whether it is possible or not to build on previous gradual approaches in general, and why not the implementation of the remuneration system in UPU uh, which proved also its feasibility, although it needs review, but it proved uh, feasibility. So uh, many models of gradual opening up may be suggested, one of which I may suggest the following. Invite UPU to play a regulatory uh, role in this issue, uh, to put the game rules in a way that takes into consideration the difficulties that may face designated operators. Uh, two, to elaborate an action plan based on a step-by-step -step approach uh, three, a step-by-step -step approach should be combined based on geographic consideration, type of services, timeline, so on. Uh, a step-by-step -step approach uh, uh, 
should be based on prioritizing the solution ready for opening up, considering a timeline schedule, and considering, uh, considering also readiness of the region's regulation to adopt an opening up uh, decision. Uh, the timeline will allow, uh, uh, I, oh, sorry, I suggested this because I'm, I'm noticing that from region to another, readiness for opening up differs based on the maturity of the economic model and the regulatory framework. The timeline will allow countries to learn from the experiences of those who started first, and the UPU may then amend the game rules, and uh, is, uh, UPU is the authority uh, at the end of regulation at the international level. This is not a new role. So in the, I think in such approach may come for those who still hesitate and who have always recalled the need for an impact study a uh, long time ago. And as our dearest panelists from Australia already said, we need a plan that does not really leave anyone behind. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Tunisia. So now we've had comments from Malaysia, Romania, Uniglobe, Kazakhstan, and Tunisia. Now, oh, no, I'll come to you. <laughs> I'll, I'll come to you, Bile. Um, but there's been a number of comments and questions that have been made. So I'd like to, Keith and Kate, in, in no particular order, but for our guests coming from uh, UPU and IMAG, uh, sorry, UPS and IMAG, I'd like to ask you, do you have any comments or remarks concerning the remarks that have come from the floor? And then uh, when you've had a chance, had a shot at providing some comments or responses, we'll turn for a, a brief comment for our colleagues here um, who are also representing members, member countries. So Keith and Kate. Well, first of all, uh, I need to make sure that I say this because I forgot to say it earlier. This is UPS, it's not the Global, Global Express Association. So Carlos recovered there. Anyway, uh, I'd like to start with a story. And this is a real life factual story. And it's happened several times. And this will address, I think, the core of many of your questions. There is a post here. I'm sure they're in this room. I don't know if I see them or not. And they were in a reasonably sized developing country. You know, they were, they were one of the more developed developing countries. They wanted an e-commerce solution. So they wanted us to sit there and help facilitate it because they were being undermined by one of our competitors in their country that were already there. Uh, may or may not be in this room. And we tried to work together to give it to them. They already had the platform. They'd already done all IT work, which you can see I'm not so good at. Uh, and we thought we could help them because we thought they had enough volume. Well, sure enough, we get into the details and prices were okay. But then it came to the transportation infrastructure. How do you get the ULD into that country? Trying to do it once every day? No, that didn't work. Once a week? Still didn't work. Once a week from three countries over? That worked. But you didn't have the volume. And the prices weren't there because you can't sit there and sustain losses while they try and gain market share when they only have a limited package within their network. Ultimately, they fell apart. They were disappointed in us because we tried to do something we couldn't give them. And now, do you, do you think that helped the USO? At the end of the day, the post is still by itself competing with a competitor that's more efficient in the market or whatever. I don't know the dynamics. All I know is they were not happy with the situation, so they're competing alone. It didn't help their employment situation. It didn't help fund their USO because they were still the same roadblock they had before they met us, they had after they met us, and we couldn't help them. Now fast forward. You have an existing platform right now that already has goods going back and forth. Maybe fast, maybe not fast, don't know, but it's there. You already had an IT infrastructure that they had in place. You have the ability, if we're gonna ask you to deliver packages, just ask, not require, voluntary, don't wanna do it, don't do it, to deliver packages to market rate. I imagine we do the same, figure something out, to where that enables the density building for developing countries to sit there and start to get volume now so they can build that ULD. Otherwise, right now, they're sitting there trying to find a solution that it's hard because you have to start somewhere. And this enables a connectivity between the organizations to start somewhere. And I don't know how it all works. I don't know if we'd use what communication or what transportation or whatever. All I know is that when you whiteboard and you go through it, and you start to use existing infrastructure right now to build the densities necessary for developing countries to start to make a bigger outreach and a bigger presence. This is an enabler working together rather than not. 
That takes care of the employment to a certain extent, to the extent we're able. That takes care of the, uh, the universal service obligation to a certain extent. And I'd like to leave it with this one, and we've been told this many times, and sometimes they mean it, sometimes they don't, but fail fast, fail small. Now, sometimes I get kind of kicked for failing at all, but at the same time, this is in the hands of the people in this room. If it's not going in the direction you don't want, and that's why governance issues got it. Don't, want to, don't overdo it. You got a barcode. You have an opportunity for a willing country to take a package and be paid a market rate to take a package. If you don't want to take it, don't. If it's not going well, stop. There's nothing that says this has to go on forever if it's not going the way people in this room want it. And so I think it answers a lot of the, a lot of the questions raised here and the concerns because, yeah, there are a lot of concerns that have to be thought out here. But I'd like to think paying a package or paying a post a market rate to deliver a package helps the employment, helps the USO, and achieves the ability for longer-term supply chains to expand in developing countries, the, the posts that need it the most. So, thank you. Thanks, Keith. Keith. Yeah, just yeah. A, a couple of brief um, notes. I, the gentleman from Malaysia referred, I called it international work sharing, you called it global work sharing, which I think is a better term. So I'm going to start using that because the model is there. And I wanted to just um, toss it back, well, on the work sharing. And I'm sorry to be so US centric, but it's the, it's the post I know the best, the studies. And I'm sure this one's dated. And, and Jim or Allison can probably maybe know a more recent number. But Work sharing saved the Postal Service $14 billion. This was a 2004 study. And the US economy, $1 billion. That's money they can now put into capital investment. That's money that they don't have to raise prices on their products and services, keeps them competitive, keeps more postal employees, uh, You know, keeps you from having to reduce your staff and those kinds of things. So that opportunity, I think it is a good model. And then I just want to maybe put back to the to those of you in the audience here, the countries and the designated operators, is there an interest in market testing some of these products and services? Are there ideas to do what Keith is saying and some of the, some of the suggestions? And, and there are individual companies here who can offer better ideas on products that we can market test over a year or two years or however. And you get a group in a room and I just, I, and we move forward. So we're actually, when we go to the Extraordinary Congress, we're either ready to go with a test or maybe, you know, maybe we've already launched something. So I just, is there an appetite to take a bite from the apple and start? Because to me, that is a step-by-step -step process. We've already done the talking step. Let's do, let's do a concrete step and move the ball forward. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Keith. Uh, please stay with us for the next session because I myself have a lot of questions for you about the, the, the models you, both you uh, uh, suggested. And we have constraints not from our sides, from the regulation sides, for customs, etc. So what they accept from CN38, and to tell you more about our logistics and operation will never be accepted for cargo. It's not by us, it's by the customs authorities. And even for the pie, everyone they want to take a part of the, of the pie. But I'm speaking here because part of the Boston Network, I'm speaking all, all openly because I want to tell you, you tell me how we can address this together. As our dear friend Vincenzo said, profit making area, I can take a part of the pie as a rural area and not be profiting. And then UPS, you can send mail to UPS at Cairo, but not send it at the New Valley. So I will be harmed. I will never be, this is a concern that we have as DOs. So please be prepared to, to answer this for, for the next session because we want how, how to, this is openly, we said openly, this is what we have. So let us, let us explore and, and see what you can address because there is monopolistic practices, there is profit uh, industry areas, everyone is focusing on it. And this is universal service obligations and the rural areas that we are suffering to serve. So please stay with us for, for the next questions. And Raj, uh, you have uh, to Nermeen, talk. this is going to be an awesome, awesome afternoon session because I'm going to have to turn to you as a co-chair to give you the floor as a question asker. So uh, that's all fun. Listen, uh, in the interest of time, we've got 10 minutes. We're, we're extending the session by 15 minutes. We're five minutes into it. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Ghana, I, now Bile, I know you want to take the floor. Uh, and I know you're an eloquent guy. 
So maybe you can close us out unless you have a fast question. And for Will and Vincenzo, if you have any comments on the questions and remarks that have been made from the floor, can you hold it to 30 seconds? Can you do it? We want to get the floor, get the mic back into the hands of those folks. Okay, so Will and Vincenzo, let's go. 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I think Time's up. that no, uh, uh, Kate, <laughs> Kate and, uh, and Kate well answered you know, the, the question from uh, the audience. But again, I have two remarks to you. Get closer. Okay. First to Kate. I mean, I understand that it's uh, in your behavior act as cherry picking, you know. When you say, I don't want remuneration, I don't want uh, USO. Postal operator, operator cannot choose to not adding remuneration and not adding uh, USO. So we want to create a level playing field or we want to be, let's say, disaligned in cooperation. That's 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> to Kate. Kate is uh, stressing the concept of having a test. I think I was uh, quite eloquent uh, describing that there are some uh, uh, features that also Nermin now uh, was highlighting related to, to how uh, it's very difficult to regulate a market when many stakeholders are playing all together and check whether is correctly flow or addressed to uh, uh, stakeholders with respect to rural areas and metropolitan uh, uh, to say profitable and not profitable area. We have to check that. We cannot make a test. What do you mean for test? If you want to make a test, you bring volumes, put in the network and deliver. But then you have a test. But it's the reality which will give us uh, the result of this operation, which cannot be seen by a test. I'm sorry. Uh, just oh, sorry. Over to Mike. Oh, over to Will. And you know what? Stick around in the afternoon session. We can really of course. explore this. Yeah. Make them propose. Absolutely. Okay. Will, Thanks, Raj. Right. I'm going to take 60 seconds, but I will be very brief. Thank you, Malaysia. I think uh, your comments absolutely align with where we need to go. So thank you. To our colleague from Romania, I also agree about that question around a global single market and how can we facilitate better communication between all of the stakeholders that are on this uh, podium today and with everyone else. Uh, to our colleague from UniGlobe, I, I could only agree more. We need to ensure that we don't leave our workers behind. You're absolutely right in terms of the work that they've done over the COVID period and for decades before that. And I think. The, the worker question is a question that governments around the world are, gar are grappling with, and I think it's a question that the UPU can help out on. To our colleague from Kazakhstan, um, the question around why do postal sector player rights and obligations and their relations, I would say the answer is, as governments, we choose whether the wider postal sector have rights or, or obligations in our countries. I would argue that that is not something the UPU regulates to a large extent. It is an obligation that sits on member countries themselves and what they do domestically. If I want to make Keith a DO, I can do that tomorrow. If I want to say, Keith, please deliver to Uluru, um, and that's a condition of working in Australia, I, c I can do that. So I, thi I think it's not a question for the UPU. I think it's a question for the UPU how we facilitate connectivity between the operators that our various countries have agreed to allow to operate in our countries. Um, I think that picks up on a bit that our colleague from Tunisia also raised. I would only agree that it's important from a government perspective to deliver on the sustainable development goals. And I think to deliver on the sustainable development goals, we need to ensure that we have a sustainable market that delivers on it. Um, I totally agree in terms of an action plan I totally agree in terms of prioritising and achieving a timeline. I think the question of geography is an interesting challenge. For me in Australia, we have 24 million people, but 80% of them live in five cities, and the rest live in a geographic land space the size of the United States. 
So we have this problem of geography as well. I know we're developed, I know others are developing, but I would just say, I think, again, the UPU's role is between countries and it's a question for countries how we can deliver on that. And, and I talked in my remarks around social development and I think it's a really important pillar to help countries that need it actually lift themselves up and lift those standards so that every one of our citizens gets the same level of service. I think I've ticked everyone off, but thank you uh, Raj, for the time. Thanks, Will. If you could pass the mic over. Uh, that's great. And you know what? In Canada, we have a very similar situation with regards to our universal service obligation where uh, the majority of our population lives within 100 kilometers of the U.S. border, but we still have a universal service obligation that requires us to deliver to the north and to the Arctic and, and all that. So, Nermin, you want to... Uh, our colleagues from, uh, from Ghana, Ghana. Yeah. yes, we have the floor to ask questions, but will be answered in the next session, okay? Because first, we'd like to thank the interpreters for appearing <coughs> with us. We're almost there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Naomi and Raj, for this opportunity to contribute to this very, very important uh, conversation that's going on. I also want to thank Keith and Catherine. Your presentations were great. It's changed my perception I had on this entire opening up, so I think it was a great presentation. Now, what I see evident is some form of collaboration is, is necessary. I mean, that's a fact, and that's something we can all not run away from. I share in your presentation in Ghana, for instance, during the COVID, uh, one of the U, uh, WSPS uh, was our reliever. You know, we had a certain relationship where they gave us some good rates, and through them, we could ship to Europe, to the US, and a couple of places. So yes, already, there is some collaboration uh, that's ongoing. But what I think we need to also mention is there's a clear difference between the WPSPs who have some affiliation with UPU and some wider postal sector operators who have no relationship with the UPU. And in our place, so for instance, Ghana and Nigeria, I can use these two countries as examples, we have some wider postal service operators operating who have no relationship, no affiliation to the UPU, and they are killing us. They are killing us. I mean, uh, to some of them, they, they actually receive items destined for post office boxes. And because they don't have any relationship with the post, they end up finding ways to deliver these items and it becomes a very cumbersome process. And so I'm happy the UPU is considering this conversation. And the fact that we have some US, UPSPS who are some in some way related to the post, uh, related to the UPU, there will be a certain level playing ground for some conversations that will proceed into the future. But I have some few questions uh, for IMAC, for instance. You listed a couple of members, uh, which include the DHL e-commerce, uh, USPS Global Business, FedEx Cross Border, for instance, these ones. I want to know whether they are the same as the courier companies that are operating in, out there. You know, so for the FedEx, for instance, Ghana, we have FedEx, DHL, they're all there. I want to know whether these are some specific wings or they are just the same companies that do operate. Now, this is what I want to propose, and I believe as the conversations go on, we will definitely have all these things discussed. But I think the UPU in going forward uh, really need to come up with some really tight regulations that would ensure the reciprocity that uh, my brother from Italy was talking about is achieved. Because on one, on one hand, we also do need some form of collaboration from these USPS. Uh, but on another hand, we also have a certain service to provide. And so if there's a middle ground, and I think UPU will be that perfect middle ground to help and aid with the negotiation so that Everybody is covered. And I believe strongly if we are able to do this, it will go a long way into expanding the life of some deals. Because if we don't do this, some designated operators are gradually dying, especially with our loss on the other hand, especially on the financial services front and other areas. Uh, we really need this conversation to continue and sealed. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, dear colleague. Uh, now we came to the end of our session, and uh, please uh, thank you so much for for coming for expanding the session 15 minutes. We will be back for the third part led by our dear colleague Stuart and Samir. So please come again at 2030 to listen to all our panelists about all uh, this and how to work uh, and to make the opening successful for both parties. Thank you so much, and uh, wish you a nice day. Thank you very much.